used to be involved uh, in the Greek anti-capitalist front when they were in Greece. And at the moment, it serves the purpose of uh, getting us involved uh, because there are a lot of organizations that we can't really get along with and we don't have a lot of space uh, to, to discuss our ideas and find a common ground with a lot of other comrades. So we, we use this as a means to an end to uh, coordinate and share, etc., etc. et, cetera, et cetera. Um, So the discussion today takes place uh, in a very heated environment, uh, just a few weeks after the European elections. And the debate uh, that happened took place uh, just before the elections, it's uh, uh, very profound. Uh, there is a global austerity going on, and there's a uh, big debate among the ruling classes about the next stage of uh, uh, the way that the handling of the crisis will be uh, will happen. And um, I think that uh, there are three main uh, elements in this debate. Uh, the first and the most uh, profound is the one saying we need a very strong European Union uh, to be the gl global uh, competitor against the uh, uh, different imperialistic uh, Poles like uh, the States or China and Russia. And there's a new, uh, relatively new uh, poll saying uh, we would better destroy this union and serve uh, more clearly one of the existing uh, imperialist groups uh, that take place, more, the States being uh, the easiest uh, to just follow. Uh, in this uh, situation where we, we see this debate going on and we saw the liberal left and the conservatives uh, usually with both hands uh, serving this purpose of the first group, saying we need a strong European Union. We don't have a lot of uh, time or uh, it's not relevant to discuss uh, the details now. We have to like uh, support the existing union and uh, maintain the status quo. Um, the new thing that uh, came up was uh, a group of parties that serve uh, the profits of uh, different sides of uh, the European uh, bourgeois class uh, that say uh, we're going to fight for this, we will fight for a different kind of union or a different kind of uh, concession between the states, uh, different financial policies, uh, stronger uh, state apparatus, European apparatus, uh, austerity and anti-migrant uh, speech, etc. You all know about that. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, in this uh, two-part thing that we saw going on and we saw all the previous political uh, parties, the pa political parties that used to be in different sides of the debate in the past, we saw them aligning uh, in the first uh, poll saying yes to the European Union. I would just like to say that for, from our point of view, there's always a third poll, uh, poll that <coughs> says we defy the European Union and we defy uh, austerity and we just want something else which is something not clear. Uh, it's uh, it's um, quite messed up because it doesn't have a very clear uh, program and doesn't know where it goes, but definitely is on the side of the protesters that uh, take the streets all around uh, this side of the world. Uh, so as uh, Antarsia, uh, we thought of uh, organizing a meeting here in London and making this discussion relevant because this discussion here seems to be uh, in a different, uh, it seems to be taking a different direction than the one that we are used to uh, discuss uh, when we discuss the same issue in our home country. Um, it's a very uh, sensitive issue, but it's definitely usually the only issue we discuss with when when you ever discuss politics uh, with someone. It's the only issue that comes up the last few years in Britain. Um, so we want to just. Uh, open this discussion, I would like to open this discussion by saying that what we need here, what we need uh, this discussion to be about is about the different direction that exists, but no one really represents it. Uh, the direction that says we don't want the union, we defy it, at the same time we defy, uh, the, we uh, take the side of uh, the working class rights, the migrant uh, rights, and we are st struggling for uh, an overthrowing of the current system. Uh, so with us today is uh, Simon Elmer, who is the coordinator and co-director of uh, Architects for Social Housing, and Michael Roberts, who is a Marxist economy 
and I am an economist, sorry, and I will describe his full uh, work before he just starts speaking. Uh, so we'll speak, start today with Simon, and then uh, it will be Michael. Yeah, okay. Thanks for having us. Uh, and then Nikos, of course, because I, Nikos, I, I, I forget <laughs> this last entry. It's down there. <laughs> this last entry, Nikos uh, represents uh, Andarsia itself, yeah. and we'll uh, speak about the group and, and the stance. So that's it. Thank you. Um, I call this paper, my paper, Leaving the Garden, Brexit and the Housing Crisis. <clears throat> In the good old days, before 23rd of June 2016, when barely a week passed without some new demonstration or protest against the latest round of austerity measures, cuts to benefits, ATOS deaths, privatization of the NHS, dismantling of the welfare state, erosion of civil liberties, expansion of police powers, deportation of immigrants, or declaration of war, it was still widely agreed that the most pressing political issue in the UK was the crisis of housing affordability. Four years later, that issue has fallen down the hierarchy of the public's attention. Why campaign to save something as boring as social housing when you can save the world by doing yoga on Waterloo Bridge. <clears throat> but housing is not only an aspect of British life about which, drawing on the work of architects for social housing, I can speak with some knowledge about how it has been influenced by a membership of the European Union. It is also where different strands of UK society, economic, political, and social, converge. Housing, therefore, is a prism through which to test the truth values of the claims about our membership of the EU, as well as the counter arguments for leaving. I can't today go into the arguments for remaining, but they all imply, one way or another, that since 1973, when the UK belatedly joined the European Economic Community, we've been living through a golden age of economic growth and wealth creation, of unprecedented peace between the formerly warring nations of Europe of multicultural tolerance and the rule of human rights in this best of all possible worlds. But what does housing reveal about the economic, political and social realities of the pre-Brexit Garden of Britain, from which, like a modern day Adam and Eve, we're so rashly attempting to eject ourselves? So part one of my paper is called UK Housing in the European Union. So unlike, for example, the way the European Union's fourth railway package, because I thought Eddie Dempsey was going to be here, has imposed the privatisation on their railway services on member states, the influence of EU legislation on housing provision is less clear cut. The line between neoliberalism as a late stage of capitalism since the 1970s and the EU as a legislative instrument of its implementation is blurred or at least it is to me, because I'm not an expert on EU legislation. But current UK housing policy, which I do know something about, is based on three neoliberal principles. One, that attracting investment in UK residential property from the private sector, including foreign investors, overseas buyers, and offshore financial jurisdictions, should be the primary source of revenue for households. Two, that according to the so-called law of supply and demand, massively increasing the supply of residential properties for market sale will reduce house prices in general across the board. And three, that the sale of prime and super prime residential properties for the highest possible market price will cross subsidize the provision of the so-called affordable housing in which UK citizens can actually afford to live. Now, all three of these principles, I believe, are fundamentally flawed as a model for the provision of housing need. One, because private investment in the UK property market has transformed our housing into a global commodity, with investors, to just take one example, speculating on shares in the value uplift consequent upon planning permission being granted on a piece of land that we'll never see, and which may never even be developed. 
Two, because the law of supply and demand doesn't describe this property market whose financialization by global capital has driven prices up as it is intended to rather than down. And three, because far from cross-subsidizing even affordable housing, let alone homes for social rent, such investment is instead funding the estate regeneration program that is demolishing tens of thousands of council homes to make way for the development of primarily market sale properties. Now, <clears throat> as a result of these policies, these UK housing policies, between 2014 and 16, around one in six new build residential properties in London were sold to overseas investors. In 2017, that figure rose to 30%, and in the second half of 2018, overseas investors purchased 57% of all homes in central London. Now, although some overseas buyers might use their properties as a home for a week or so during the year, most investors are either buy-to-let landlords or speculators on London's housing market. Now, <clears throat> partly as a result of this investment, the total value of the UK housing stock in 2018 was 7.29 trillion pounds. And that's risen by a third in the last decade alone. Nobody will be surprised to hear that 1.77 trillion of that housing stock is in London, nearly a quarter of the total. Equivalent to 3.5 times the gross domestic product of the UK and nearly 60% of the UK's entire net wealth, the UK property market now constitutes an economy unto itself. And it is this that UK housing policy is being written to keep afloat at the cost of the housing of its citizens. So, 58% of housing demand in London is for lower mainstream properties and homes for sub-market rent. Yet only a quarter of the properties with planning permission in the five years between 2017 and 21 will go on sale at this price. As a result, the number of residential properties under construction in London, uh, unsold properties in, uh, in London, under construction in London, reached a record high of 31,500 last month while the total number of unsold new build properties on sale for more than 1 million has hit a record high of 3,000 units. At the other end of the financial scale, of the 45,500 residential units completed in London in 2016-17, a mere 16% were even affordable housing, and of these, a mere 5% were for social rent, the lowest cost and most in-demand tenancy type. The remaining 84% were all for market sale. In the decade since the financial crisis, London's house prices have risen from an average of 245,000 in April 20, 2009 to 463,000 pounds a day. That's more than 13 times the average London salary of 35,000 pounds. In inner London, the average price of a new build property is now 786,000 pounds. Meanwhile, rents on London's private market in which 30% of London households now have to find a home, have risen to an average of £1,617 per month. That's 73% higher even than the UK average. The total rent paid by UK tenants last year rose to £51.6 billion. That's more than double, way more, than the £22.6 billion they paid in 2007. At the same time, there are 20,000 long-term empty homes in London alone, with more than 10 times that number across England. Extraordinarily, half of the residential units in London's new build developments currently stand empty. Unsurprisingly, the likelihood of a residential property being empty rises with its market value. 39% of properties worth between one and five million pounds are currently underused, a figure that rises to 64% for properties worth more than five million. And of the properties purchased by overseas buyers or investors, um, an appalling 42% stand empty. Now, as a result of what the European Union would describe as this liberalization of UK housing provision, at the end of 2018, there were an estimated 165,000 people homeless in London alone, that's one in 52 of the capital's population, and over 300,000 homeless people across the UK. These numbers don't include the hidden homeless with an estimated one in five people under the age of 25 having couch surfed 
over the last year. That's selecting someone's uh, floor or, or couch. 225 of them in London. Roughly the same number, 244,000 are on council housing waiting lists in London. While across England, there are 1.16 million households waiting, or, uh, waiting for a council. Now, <clears throat> this is kind of a summary of the housing crisis. Given the lack of response from the British public to the causes of this housing crisis, either in the polling booth or on the streets of London, my very strong suspicion is that middle-class Remainers in general care very little about the negative effects of neoliberalism on other people, so long as they continue to profit from themselves, most noticeably from the rising value of their homes. Their well-mannered protests are not against the threat of these figures worsening as we leave, if we leave the European Union, but expressive of their fears of becoming the victims rather than the beneficiaries of the neoliberalism responsible for them. Whether they know it or not, and whether they admit it or not, those who vote to remain in the European Union are voting for more of the same, if not worse. Okay, part two is called UK Housing After the Referendum. In May 2016, the Sunday Times Rich List reported that 26 of the 100 wealthiest people in the UK listed property as a major source of their wealth. While among the richest 1,000, there were 164 property moguls with a combined wealth of 143.7 billion pound. Now, perhaps unsurprisingly, the next month, the UK referendum returned a vote to leave the European Union by, as we know, 52% on a 72% turnout of the electorate at some 17.4 million people. Since then, the value of the pound has fallen from 1 euro 26 and 1 dollar 42 to at the beginning of this week 1 euro 12 and 1 dollar 27 that's 12 cents in the euro and 15 cents in the us dollar the immediate effect of this was that by november 2016 it's only a few months later over 400,000 britons had lost their status as dollar millionaires more importantly however was the drop in investment in uk housing and especially in london as a safe place for global capital. Now, as an example, and I want to take as a case study of this disinvestment, one of the schemes that um, Ash Architects of Social Housing has proposed, proposed design alternatives for is the West Kensington and Gibbs Green council estates, which are in Hammersmith and Fulham in West London. Uh, we worked with these residents in the eight months leading up to the referendum. Five years before that, in June 2011, um, capital and counties properties developers, a property developer, they're called Capco for sure, which owns the adjoining Earl's Court site, they submitted a planning application to demolish and redevelop both of these council estates. In September 2012, despite the scheme being opposed by 80% 80, 80 of residents, Hammersmith and Fulham Council granted outline planning permission on the scheme, and the following April, both estates were stock transferred to capital, Capco for 90 million pound. Uh, this was later estimated to be less than 10% of their market value at the time. Now, Capco's scheme proposed demolishing the 760 homes on the existing estates and replacing them with a total of 7,500 residential properties spread across the combined sites, the two estates and the um, Hills Court one. Over 800 of these have been built on the Lily Square development to the south where, to give you an idea, two bedroom apartments went on sale for 1.2 million pounds. 89% of the additional homes were to be for market sale, with none set aside for social rent. The 760 new dwellings allocated to replace the demolished council estates on the two estates would be a mix of affordable rent, which can be up to 80% of market rate, rent to buy schemes and shared ownership properties, which are far beyond the reach of most uh, Londoners. Now, <clears throat> It was thanks to cowboy schemes like this, and there's hundreds of them across London, that in the two years before the referendum, the UK property market expanded by £400 billion. Pound. However, in the uncertainty leading up to the referendum, share prices for Capco, the developers, started to drop. And they fell from £4.72 in August 2015 to £3.27 in March 2016. Following a slowdown in sales for the, depart the apartments in Lily Square, the million pounds sort of stuff, 
Capco's managing director said he feared the market for high value residential dwellings in London was falling. And he was right. While the West Kensington and Gibbs Green estates are still standing, the demolition of the Earl's Court uh, Exhibition Centre began in December 2014. Since that time, the site has lost more than half of its value. In fact, Capco's land holdings in the venture lost 10.5% of their value in the first three months of 2019 alone. According to a recent valuation, Capco's share of the site is now worth £412 million, down from a pre-referendum peak of £803 million in 2015. Now, as a result of this, despite sitting on planning permission since 2012, not a single unit of luxury housing has been built on the former Ellsport site. Last year, Capco began looking for buyers on which to offload at least part of the land, but nobody has come forward. Capco's share prices continue to drop, falling 54% since its 2015 peak, and they've now admitted that this price is primarily down to a reduction in the gross development value of the site once building work is completed. And last month, the local council, Hamlet, Smith and Fulham, announced that it would be raising the funds to compulsory purchase the site back. Now, when outraged liberals demand to know how I can possibly be in favour of Brexit, I point to the levelling off of house prices in England and the drop in house prices in London since the referendum. To the pause in London's estate demolition programme, of which this is an example, as overseas and offshore investors pull out of the UK property market, and to the fall in land values consequent upon both. These perceived negatives in the supposedly absolute good of economic growth on which capitalism relies for its profits are in effect positive forces against the so-called liberalization of UK housing. Removing the barriers to renationalizing housing provision in the UK, such as the, uh, the EU prohibition on state aid, will require far more than leaving the European Union beginning with overthrowing half a century of neoliberal orthodoxy. But just the threat of doing so has already removed some of the financial incentives to continue pursuing UK housing policy based on the investment needs of global capital rather than the housing needs of the UK population. However, excuse me, there's a caveat to all this. Markets recoil from uncertainty and perhaps when Boris Johnson was installed in number 10, it seems likely, and the new government removes what's left of our building and planning regulations for inv before inventing fi further financial incentives for the global ruling class to invest even more of their dirty money in UK property, perhaps then the market will recover. And we really will look back on the years before Brexit is the good old days. But I don't think so. Perception is crucial to markets. And since the referendum dropped a turd into the cocktail glass of Europe, London has lost its reputation as the second home for Europe's jet-setting classes. So the customer base has contracted radically. Just as importantly, 275 city firms and £900 billion of financial assets are relocated out of the UK. That's a lot of bankers, hedge fund managers, financial advisors and corporate lawyers who will no longer be living or investing in London property. Most importantly of all, <coughs> the referendum, followed by the recent European Parliament elections, has shown that the UK can no longer be regarded as under the thumb of the Conservative Labour monopoly that will underwrite any sudden collapse in property values if and when the housing bubble bursts, as they did after the financial crisis. Perhaps, as some have predicted, the UK will become an offshore tax jurisdiction for global capital under the umbrella of US imperialism. Although some would say London has already been that for some time. But there is another possibility. This is the third part of my talk, which is called the UK after Brexit. I doubt any of us who have suffered from the fiscal policies of austerity over the past decades have noticed the benefits of living in a country with the fifth largest economy in the world. Despite this, one of the apparently decisive arguments for remaining in the European Union is that a smaller GDP for a post-Brexit UK will 
increase social inequality. Now, the gross domestic product of the world in 2018 was about 80 trillion US, US dollars. And over a quarter of that, 20.5 trillion, came from the United States of America. To test the argument that greater national wealth means wider dis distribution of that wealth, you only have to look at the US, the richest country in the history of the world, where wages have not increased in real terms since the 1970s, which has no national health cover, the highest number and percentage of citizens in prison of any country in the world, the highest spending on the military of any country in the world, a corrupt, politicized, and militarized legal system, an institutionally racist police force, and a fascist game show host for a president. If that's what a quarter of the world's GDP gets you, maybe we could do with a different measure the wealth of our society. Most of us have lived our entire lives within one form or other of the, of the European Union, a period coextensive with the rise of neoliberalism as the dominant economic and political system in Western democ democracies. And after 46 years of neoliberal governments, conservative, labor, coalition, and conservative again, there is perhaps no more ideologically hegemonic country in Europe than the UK until now. Whatever its consequences for us, and that will depend on what we do after we leave the EU, if we leave the EU, the threat of Brexit has opened a wound in the hegemony of neoliberal capitalism. This accounts, I'd suggest, for the almost exclusively and overwhelmingly emotive character of the reactions to it, much as if we're religious fanatics who have been told our God is dead and it's time to find a new meaning to our lives. Personally, I'm a great believer in killing gods, which is the point of departure for the self-determination of the working, working class kept servile by their worship. The, the apparently firm conviction that free from the maternal embrace of Europe's fulsome breast, we will automatically fall into the paternal grasp of our evil fathers, shows, I think, just how childish and subservient we've become as an electorate apparently capable only of choosing which brand of neoliberalism our political parties will spoon feed us. It's a measure also of how complete has been the defeat of the political left in this country, that the only way liberals can think to defend themselves from the conservative right is to cling to the skirts of the European Union. If we'd spent half the effort we've squandered over the past few years, arguing why we should remain part of the neoliberal empire, instead, working to create a socialist alternative, we could be on the verge of a period of genuine political and economic change in the UK. We're not, but that work starts now. As the example of Greece has so brutally demonstrated, the European Union will not allow the democratically elected socialist government of a member state to govern in anything but name. Unlikely as it may seem in this most conservative of countries, if the UK is ever to have a socialist government, which, unlike Syriza, is not under the yoke of the unelected troika of the European Commission, the European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund, escaping the iron grip of the European Union is the first step. Eating from the tree of knowledge always has its consequences, but how much longer do we want to live in ignorance and obedience to the God? Thank you, uh, Next, we have Michael Roberts. Uh, Michael is a maths economist, and I will just describe a few things that he has done. Uh, he has been working in the city of London for 35 years, and he is the author of The Great Recession, A Marxist View, uh, The Long Depression. Is that there? <laughs> Sorry, but he's. Uh, My writing's terrible. Uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but I've given up writing. I just, I just do this now. Uh, the World in Crisis. The World in Crisis. Mark Stuhan yeah. is this book there, and he regularly blogs at thenextrecession.wordpress.com. Um, well, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, thanks for introducing me. Um, I'll probably tell you a little bit more about myself, that I have worked in the City of London and in various commercial banks and investment banks in the uh, heart of the evil father in the Garden of Eden, working with them 
to make it a better world for us all uh, in various banks, including uh, ones that are commonly mentioned in the, in the press as either being blood-sucking vampires uh, and so on. And in that environment, I can tell you, over the last 35 years, I'm not working there now, um, the idea of uh, the European Union, at least in London, was regarded with a great deal of enthusiasm. And the reason for that is simply that this was, a, they saw in particular the relationship between Britain and the European Union as being absolutely key. Because all the big American banks who came over in the late 1980s and early 1990s to occupy Canary Wharf and various other parts of the city, their reason for coming over was because of the opening up of Britain for business, for the movement of the stock markets and bonds, for foreign exchange, for turning Britain into uh, a financial uh, free-for-all. And that, that basis of that for the American banks is then to be able to go into Europe to invest and to play a role in, do, in getting profits out of the development of the European Union. Britain was key to that because they, it's, it was an English language, it's right on the Greenwich Mean Time, and it had the traditions of a, of a long historical role for the financial sector. So it was key to the, to the process of the development of the European Union in its later stages. But uh, if I could just uh, go back a while, because it's now 70 years since we've had, in a way, the first starts towards the development of European Union integration, starting with the common market when a small group of European countries, capitalist countries, came together in order to break down the barriers they had on tariffs and other trade so that they could trade freely, and then moving on to what we now, we're all now aware of, apparently, in Britain, about customs union. Then we moved on to a customs union where the regulations and everything were harmonized so that you could move goods and uh, capital around the area without uh, having to continually check on it. It was all harmonized in such a way. Uh, that took place 70 years ago. And it's uh, be developed eventually into a political project. And it always was originally a political project. The purpose, as I think the chair mentioned, to begin with, of the European Union, as it eventually became with the Treaty of Rome, was to provide a new pole for capital in the center of the world, <coughs> on the one hand against American imperialism, and on the other hand of rising Japanese and Asian capitalist economies. Europe had was the leaders of European capital, uh, although linked and relying upon the the armed defenses of uh, American imperialism, wanted to develop a separate capitalist pole uh, led by France and Germany and to develop that with its, eventually with its own trading area and its own development to compete against American imperialism and growing Asian imperialism as well, represented at that time by Japan and later on by the new industrial Asian economies. So it was a major political project. It was political also, for one reason that has been mentioned, is that the purpose of that was to unify European capital so that there no longer will be a battle within European capital over who should rule and who should rule in the world, but actually should be some a degree of unity and integration to ensure that they can compete worldwide. And we'd have to say that from the period of the early development of that uh, common market up to the point of the European Union and onwards, in some ways, it was a relative success. It brought together 12, 15 countries with common trading, common customs union, and inevitably that increased the ability uh, of some countries to come from nowhere and move forward. And, and if you look at the data, and I've looked at the data over and over again, from the period of about the 70s up until the late 80s, most European countries improved their productivity, and there was a degree of convergence between the most well-developed, like Germany and Northern Europe, and the Southern European countries, particularly after the revolutions in Portugal and Spain and Greece, the overthrow of Bonapartist and fascist regimes, and the coming into the European Union. Greece was very late, too late, but the others came in earlier, and they gained from this trading area. Uh, their, their small capitalist economies gained from these trading areas, and uh, went forward. But that was also the period when capitalism had a reasonable degree of growth. 
not just in Europe, but internationally as well. And that began to change by the middle of the 1970s and onwards, and we entered what Simon has uh, correctly described as a whole new period, which we now, at least in academic circles, called neoliberalism. I don't know. I don't suppose any working class or movement knows what the hell that means. Uh, but it simply means, as far as I'm concerned, it's pretty simple, that no longer did you rely upon a welfare state, developing a welfare state, decent public services, decent health service, decent education, using the state to try and take the economy forward and develop technology. Quite the opposite. You wanted to slash the state. You wanted to destroy the public services. You wanted to uh, hold down wages. You wanted to privatize those sectors that are out of the control of capitalism. Why? Why did that happen? Why did neoliberalism happen? See, I don't think it was because of the EU. Neoliberalism existed throughout the capitalist, major capitalist economies. Uh, the EU obviously was part of that. The reason was that capitalism was no longer succeeding in developing productive forces, was no longer delivering enough profit. Wait, workers, they could no longer afford the welfare state, and they were forced to try and reverse the process and the gains that had been made in the post-war period immediately afterwards up to the mid-60s and the early 70s. And then we had the political leaders behind that process of reversing the policy of the previous two decades, the Thatchers, the Reagans, and so on, also to some extent across Europe as well. So neoliberalism was an international regime or policy, that ideology that developed in order to restore the profitability and control of capitalism and reduce the influence of the labor movement and the state internationally. That was the purpose of neoliberalism. Simon has described how effective it's been in, an area, in a very important area like housing, probably the most effective area, because in many ways, housing has never had an opportunity to develop uh, it, the grounds are on the basis of what's in the interest of the services, of pu decent public services, at least not in the UK. The UK is an epitome of neoliberal capitalism and always has been in relation uh, to, to uh, its close connections with the US. But what we have here was a change in the environment. No longer was the European Union and this common market successfully converging and bringing countries together and improving their conditions. In fact, it was beginning to go in the opposite direction. There was a divergence. And that was crucially established when the European Union leaders, the capitalist leaders, the Franco-German leaders, Schmidt and, was it Mitterrand? Or was he the other Frenchman? I can't remember which sure. president it was. Met in a, in a little road and decided that they were going to move on to the next stage of integration, which was to develop a single currency, the euro, to take the integration of European capital further with a single currency, a single central bank interest rate, and to converge as best they could debt and fiscal control in, in this European economy. What's very interesting about the eurozone uh, convergence. There was no convergence about trying to get everybody up to the same standard of living. There was no convergence about trying to get everybody up to the same employment levels. There was no conversion of everybody getting up to decent public services. Now, that wasn't part of the criteria of the Eurozone. No, because that threatened the free movement of capital, which is what the purpose of this next stage was. Yes, there was convergence over one central bank telling what everybody to do, and one single currency which, mean, which whatever the conditions were in Greece or whatever they were in Finland, you had one single currency because they wanted to, as it were, straight jacket the European Union to one unit where run by Franco-German capital, whatever happened. And what you've got when you look at the data is a reversal of the previous situation. You have divergence. Then all the countries that are the weakest capitalist economies diverge, went further away from the best and most strongest countries, the strong gain and the weak lost surprise, uh, that process was accelerated in this period. It was both a product of neoliberalism generally, and also the fact that the, the introduction of the single currency and the process that was involved in that. So we had a situation where weak capitalist economies, Greece being a good example, the Greek capitalists were desperate to get into the Euro European Union and also into the Eurozone as a result because the two things came together. And when they got in, of course, their purpose was, as it were, 
to be able to attract massive amounts of foreign investment, particularly from Germany, France, and so on. And that's what they got. They got a lot of money coming in precisely in the areas that Simon's talked about, not just Britain, but a massive growth in the residential and property markets. I looked at the figures. The usual complaint about Greece is that it didn't stop its public spending. It was out of control. But if you look at the data, actually, it's nothing. Public spending wasn't out of control in, in Greece. What was out of control was private credit. It was rocketed up uh, and it mostly went into investment in unproductive areas, not even into tourism, which was supposedly Greece, Greece's great advantage, but into property and all kinds of other speculative activities. activities. And what did the people who made profit out of that, which were the French and German banks and the Greek capitalists behind them, well, did the public sector get any of that? No. Taxes were reduced in Greece as in elsewhere in a neoliberal environment. In fact, the result was that, um, I'm sure Antarctica comrades will tell me, but you'll explain this, but the Greek shipbuilding, shipping industry, which is the most famous industry in Greece, doesn't pay any tax. I mean, it's, can you believe it? It's, it's written into the constitution. This is before the European Union, but it's an indication of the inability to, to turn for the public sector to have any gain for the working class. And of course, we now know that layers and layers of the best paid and richest parts of Greece were paying no tax at all. If they weren't floating it out of the country, they were floating it in their swimming pools uh, where they were never charged or that they were supposed to be and all the other big houses that they had. This was the uh, situation. So therefore, inevitably, Tax revenues were falling while uh, property prices and credit was rising dramatically. This is a total imbalance, uh, a completely unproductive, fictitious way of, of, of taking the economy forward. And Greece was the prime example of this and therefore the biggest fall guy. And then, everybody, what happened in 2008? We had a global financial crash. The world went down. Capitalism supposedly doing fantastic. I remember being in the uh, boardrooms of the banks. Well, not the boardrooms, maybe. <laughs> but certainly in the research institutes in 2007 and saying everything's going fantastically well. We've got all these derivatives. We can't, we're just making loads and loads of money. Nothing can go wrong. And then, well, the US housing market's looking a bit iffy. <laughs> no, no, nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. We macroeconomists know what's going on. Uh, absolutely fine. Nothing to worry about. And yet, only one year later, just down the road at the London School of Economics, the Queen of England came to see the London School of Economics to make a visit in the depth of this huge slump that had then taken place, started off by the housing market, and then the derivatives crash, and then spreading right across the whole of the world for the first time. The whole of the world. A, a, a huge slump. So the Queen arrived and she was greeted by the dignities, dignitaries at the door, bowing in the usual reflex manner. And the first thing she said was, How did you know this didn't happen? How did you know this wouldn't happen? How did you miss this? She said. That's the first thing she said. And they went, oh. <laughs> And they didn't answer. But two days later, they wrote a reply from the Royal Academy in proper writing, <laughs> in which it said, I won't read it out to you because it's a bit long and boring, but the gist of it is, we have no idea why. <laughs> that was the gist of it. So the leading elements in capitalist strategy didn't understand this crisis, and when I was unable to cope with it and explain it, but the one thing they were sure about was that the people who had caused it, the banks and big business, were not going to pay for it. No, working class people were going to pay for this terrible mess. And in particular, countries like Greece and others, Portugal, Ireland, Spain to some extent, every country in Europe, the working class were asked to pay. But particularly those countries, the weakest capitalist countries, were unable to fund the huge losses that were now taking place in those economies. So the European Union now looked at a total failure. Uh, and the Eurozone looked as a total failure. And we have what was called the Eurozone debt crisis in 2012, when there were countries like Greece who were running up huge debts and couldn't pay for them, so that the bonds 
the government bonds which were being issued to try and cover this, the Greek government bonds, were diving in price. Now, who had been holding all these government bonds? Well, some Greek banks and individuals in Greece, they lost money, but mostly it was foreign banks, in particular the French, German, Italian banks. And the value of the bonds that they were now holding were worth 10% of what they paid for. They were making huge losses. There was no way that could, those losses could be allowed to be realized and be written off because, you know, if you run a company and you get, you get some money from some banker and then everything goes pear-shaped and you lose all your money, you, you just go bust. The banker doesn't get the money back on the whole. He can squeeze you as much as he can, but on the whole, he doesn't get it back. Well, oh, no, no, no. So the Greek economy's bust. The Greek government can't pay its bill. Sorry, you're still going to have to pay the bill to the French and German banks. How? How can you do this? I'll tell you what we'll do, said the European Union leaders and the IMF and the ECB. We'll lend you the money at a quite a nice rate, lower rate, lower rate, and you just pay all the French and German banks back with it. Okay, so what happens with the debt that we've now got from you? Ah, now you've got to start paying us back. <laughs> yes, we won't ask you to pay it back straight away. We'll give you time, five years, 10 years, 20 years, and it won't be at a horrible rate, but you will pay back every euro cent of it over time. And in do, to do that, we want you to slash all your public services. We want you to slash your pensions by 40%. We want to privatize anything that the Greek government's got a hold of, sell it off, and so that we, you raise enough funds in order to pay us back, not to provide services and benefits for the unemployed. There are now massive unemployment in Greece and other countries. No, no. The money is to go in one door and then out the other door back to us over a period of time. And each time you must pay, keep rolling this over indefinitely. Now, the, the Greek government debt before the great euro debt crisis was about uh, 80 to 90 percent of GDP. It was quite high, quite high because, as I explained, they weren't getting any tax revenues. Currently, after, the, after this crisis and the process that took place, it went up to 176% of GDP, approximately. Since then, they, they have had to keep paying back loans to the IMF and to uh, paid off the, all the French and German banks to the IMF primarily and the ECB. In order, and they've been asked to keep pressure on government spending and raise taxes and do all the things I've just described in order to run a surplus on the budget. What is, what is the uh, debt to GDP now in the last five years since they were told to do all this in a heavy way? It's 180% of GDP. It hasn't gone down at all. It's going to be there forever. We've worked, I think I've worked it out, that the next three generations of Greeks will still be paying for this. This is an indication of how terrible this situation has come. Now, this situation, in my view, is not necessarily a product of the European Union as the great evil, or even the Eurozone. Both the European Union and the Eurozone could well have plowed on if capitalism had been able to plow on. But capitalism cannot plow on indefinitely, providing things for people or, are, or being forced to make concessions. It was in a serious slump in 2008-9, and then the strategies of capital took the decision to preserve the interests of capital, which in particular is the finance sector, but also other sectors, the, the better off, the owners of capital, at the expense of labor and public services and so on. So whether the Greece had been in the European Union in 2015 or 2012 or not, that crisis would have still happened in some form or other, as it happened in other countries. But it was a crucial moment in 2015. And I'll just remind you, next month, it's four years since the moment that the Greek people had a referendum. <laughs> and the Greek people were asked, rather reluctantly by the leader of the Syriza government at the time, do you want to accept vicious austerity and the payment of this debt indefinitely or not? Now, that was basically what the vote, the referendum vote question was. And the campaign from 
Mrs. Merkel and the rest of you don't accept this. My God, the whole world's <laughs> going to go down and you'll be thrown out and there'll be no euro and everything. And you'll be in, out in the Aegean Sea in a small boat. It's uh, every, not talk about migrants coming into Greece. It'll be Greece out in the sea in a boat. If, if you don't vote to, to, to accept this memorandum of understanding, which is basically the program of paying this debt. And so the, the propaganda was massive. The propaganda from the government, the Syriza government, the left government, although they called the referendum, was not very strong. No, we just, what do you think? <laughs> You know, it's a difficult situation. There's a lot of debt here. On the other hand, we could be out of the euro if you don't vote for it. What do you think? We don't you decide. For God's sake, vote yes. But they did not vote yes. By 60 to 40, the Greeks said, no, we're not going to have this austerity. We, we're, we're in age on the debt, if that's what it means. The Greeks also still felt that they should stay in the euro. They saw the euro and European Union as something that they wanted to stay in. They thought... Because outside might just be a Greek trapner sinking into the down the cliff. So their idea they didn't want to be in Argentina or a Venezuela now, not then. Argentina was the fun. But, but on the other hand, they didn't want to pay this debt. So it's a it's a contradiction which capitalism has created, not not the working people. Capitalism created this contradiction. People voted against it. So there was a clear vote, and there was a choice at that moment for a left government, supposedly, in Greece to make. It could have said, in my view, and it should have said, fine, Greek people have decided we are not going to pay this debt. We are not going to have this imposition on us. We're going to go to the European leaders. Forget it. You paid, You didn't force the Germans to pay their debt after the Second World War. You're not going to ask us to pay it now. And this is nothing. It's not our fault we're in this mess despite the fact you say that all the Greeks are lazy. That's not true. But actually, by the way, the Greeks have the longest working hours in Europe. So the argument that they're lazy is ludicrous. They work the longest hours. Their productivity is low because they don't have the levels of technology and investment in the right sorts of industries. But they work long hours, mainly because they're in small businesses and all kinds of tourist industries, which mean you're working long hours, compared to German and French workers working in technology and manufacturing factories for six weeks holiday a year and going home at five o'clock, because successfully that those countries have developed the technology to do so. But we're not going to pay that debt. And that, that position should have been taken by the Syriza government. What the leaders of the Syriza government did, in the case of the finance minister, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, was to say, well, I've been trying to persuade Mr. Schaubler to see the reasonableness of our point of view, and he doesn't seem to agree, so I'm resigning. So Yanis went off. Tsipras uh, said, well, it's hopeless. We can't, we, if we don't pay the debt and we, we stand against it, we're going to be out of the euro. So we're going to pay the debt. We're going to accept the memorandum and we're going to vote it through Parliament. And those of you know, that's what has carried. And now next two weeks, is it three weeks, we're going to have a new general election. And that policy of trying to pay the debt down, which hasn't been paid down, uh, and to continually privatize and increase taxation and reduce the living standards of the Greek people dramatically in that period has continued over four years. And now the Greeks are out of the program. In other words, they don't have to uh, abide by the exact amount of neoliberal policies they should adopt. They are not going to choose their own neoliberal policies. Uh, that position is now happening. Tsipras has called an election where well, he's going to get beaten. And he's going to get beaten not by a left, not by Antarsia, not by any other left, not by the communists. He's not going to be beaten by any of these who who, who have opposed the policy that Tsipras had with him. He's going to be beaten by the conservatives. The conservatives are coming back. And what is the policy of the Greek conservatives? It's to stay in the European Union and carry out nearly more neoliberal policies. More. No, Tsipras hasn't done enough. And we've got to really turn Greece into a competitive nightmare as fast as possible by uh, increasing, reducing the pensions further, by privatizing what's not been privatized, by uh, cutting more services that haven't been cut already in order to try and get Greece uh, more competitive. And we're going to hope 
this is the key point, we're going to hope that the rest of Europe grows fast enough so when all the tide goes up, all boats go up, even the little Greek boat, and then we'll all be better off. That's been the hope for the last four years, that there'll be a rise in European growth and Greece will recover along with it. Greek capitalism will recover along with it. Well, have they? European growth has been pathetic in the last four years, and currently it's heading down below 1%. The ability of Greece to recover on the basis of a recover of European capital is really out of the question. So this situation continues. And I would make the point that whether you, this is perhaps the next point to be made. Would it have been better for the Greek government to say, we're going to leave the European Union, leave the single currency, restore the Greek drachma, because it was talked about, and then carry on on our own? Well, in my view, it's the same question I would pose about Britain too. What has been the cause of this mess? The cause of the mess is the failure of capitalism to deliver people's needs and conditions. It's the cause of this mess has been the attempt of the bankers and the owners of capital to screw labor in order to sort out their problems, to save capitalism at our expense. It's not specifically to do with whether you're in the single currency or not, because all the countries outside the single currency had got the same, had the same results in the case of all those Eastern European ones. Do you know what their solution was to this terrible downturn? Everybody left. Everybody left Latvia, Lithuania, Poland. Where did they go? They went over to Britain and Germany and elsewhere. And then uh, this enabled Britain to have a bit of a growth because it had a massive number of immigrants coming in. Productivity in Britain is terrible, but output went up for a period of time because we had all these Eastern Europeans, mainly skilled, in uh, single or at least young, who provided new uh, boost to the economy, filling the jobs that other people don't want to do or where we don't have people to do them. So that was that transformation was, as it were, dealt with by emigration and in Greece, massive emigration in Greece and in Spain and in Portugal and in Italy, continual flow of people out of Italy. All these countries, they flow out. That's been the way that it's been resolved. It wouldn't, in my view, have been resolved by just leaving the EU and the Eurozone. I could spend more time on this. I've probably spent too long. But I would just simply say that if you're outside the single currency and outside the EU, and you're still based on a capitalist economy, with a capitalist government in control, like new democracy in Greece, or God knows what we're going to have in the UK after October the 31st, do we really think that that is going to solve the problem if we've left the EU, even if it means that Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage is finance minister? <laughs> I mean, is that the option? Because that seems to be the option we're faced with. In my view, <coughs> it will be a mistake to get confused, which is what the, the capitalist class in Britain has attempted to do, because they're confused. They didn't know which way to go. Confuse us into thinking that the solution to the question is whether you're in, we must remain to save our day. No, we must leave because it's a capitalist club. I think both of those alternatives are far too cutting across what is going on in the capitalist system, the crisis in the system, and the fact that the class struggle is being covered over, missed it over by this argument about whether you're in or out. That, will be, that was the same issue in Greece in 2015, and it wasn't resolved. And it will be the same issue in 2019 in the UK if it's not resolved. The question of whether we should be in or out of Europe is, in my opinion, far less important than the question of whether we're in control of our economy and we've overthrown the, the basic commanding heights of the economy, taking it out of the hands of the bankers and the big business and placing it in the hands of a government that's working for the people and democratically under their control. It's the socialist program that's key. And also an internet, I'll finish on this point here, an international program. Greece cannot become socialist on its own. It cannot transform its future on its own. It's too small. But I have to say, neither can the UK. And neither can Germany when it comes down to developing uh, uh, a 
better society based on workers' democracy and can socialist control over services and conditions meeting people's needs. It requires a socialist international perspective, uniting those countries together as a clear alternative to the capitalist perspective of the European Union. And that is the objective, it seems to me, that we have to aim for. Whether we're in or out is a diversion in some ways. And that's, that's the point I want to make. And it's a, it can't be a dangerous diversion unless we remember the central point here is to get rid of the capitalist forces in our society, whether it's in Britain, Greece, or the European Union across the board. Well, thanks very much, Michael Roberts. Thanks for the solid description of the situation. And passing to Nikos Kapitsinis. Nikos has been uh, UK-based for... Uh, Seven. A long time. Long time. That means that he has been. That means that he has been. Uh, that means that he has been active to uh, while things were going on uh, during the, the initiation of the, of the debate about European Union, uh, etc. And he has been active in the Lexit campaign, and he is active in his union, the UCU union. So, Mikos, you. Yep. Thank you, Landis. Uh, I will not spend, thank God, a lot of time referring to Greece like Michael did. Mm -hmm. I just have one reference uh, to the Greek uh, example. And just to, to give my basic argument is that what Michael says is, is completely right, saying that, you know, yes, have capitalism, yes, you is there, but it's not, it's not this, the, you know, the, the thing that we should focus. I mean, for me, it's a necessary step to have a better life, but it's not sufficient, sufficient on its own. So this is what I will try to describe in my, uh, uh, you know, in my speech. And in my whole political life, I have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, I have been structuring my thought in a way that the strategy is always on the front, and I always adjust the tactics of everyday political life, uh, you know, compared in terms of this strategy. So we should never forget our strategy. And if we, if you know, let's let's agree that our strategy is to have a better life, which cannot probably happen within this uh, the current uh, capital system. Uh, we need to, uh, you know, to examine, to analyze uh, the movements, the decisions of the opponent of capital. And one of the major decisions, strategic decisions of capital, will is and is is becoming deeper and deeper is its integration in economic, financial, geographical terms. And Europe has been a pioneer in this in this uh, field with uh, the emergence of the European Union with its foundations, uh, you know, happening in the back in the 1940s. Uh, and so, uh, just a clarification here, because, you know, with this whole debate in the UK, I'm, I'm very weird with a very specific issue. So we may we regularly confuse Europe with the European Union. Mm. So people in the UK, they, they tend to say, oh, we are Europeans, we are Europeans. Yes, you are Europeans. Nobody said that you are not Europeans. But it's a very different thing if you are in the European Union, which doesn't at all affect whether you are European or not. So Europe is a club of countries, a continent in the geographical terms, 750 million people, 55 countries. Why the EU is something smaller, 28 member states, and is still expanding. And why is it expanding to start you know, revealing what has been happening in Europe in terms of integration? Because it seeks capital, actually seeks new market opportunities, uh, new, fresh, and deeper exploitation of workers in the periphery mainly of the European Union, etc., etc. And how all this expansion and enlargement of the EU is happening when the candidate member is applying and has to follow uh, to, uh, to satisfy certain criteria, which is the fiscal uh, stability pact, 3% of uh, public deficit of GDP, 6% of public, uh, the public debt of uh, GDP, which means, and that's a very structural issue of the European Union, which means permanent austerity, austerity forever. So in the left spectrum, I can reckon three specific stances uh, against, uh, related to the European Union. First, European Union is nice. It's not nice, sorry. European Union is there. We can reform it. Okay, so let's stay in the European Union and we will uh, handle the situation there. The second, which is 
not very, it's, 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 it's touching what uh, Michael uh, refers to is that, okay, European Union is there, but we have much bigger issues like capitalism. Let's, let's don't focus so much on this, <coughs> if, I don't, if I don't understand. And the third one that I will argue uh, in favor of is that, you know, in this, uh, in this uh, strategy towards a better life, which, which probably has as the final uh, goal the overthrow of the system, uh, overthrowing and not just exiting, that's a very, very important argument, yeah. overthrowing the European Union is a necessary step. Uh, so the EU has been created by capital, which certainly nobody thinks this and is about this. Churchill in 1942 declared, 1945 declared the, the, Europe, uh, the United States of Europe. And then before the European uh, uh, community, uh, the ECC, we had in 1950 1950s uh, the community of steel and coal, which were the main industries, if we see it in economic history terms, uh, steel and coal were the main industries of that uh, period. And that means that after the post-war period, uh, you know, uh, the European capital sought actually uh, to address all this intra-capital competition uh, within Europe, and it structured eventually, um, uh, you know, it's actually, it's actually signaled a new era for, uh, for the Europe of capital. And I think the EU, if we want to call it, give it you know, a specific name, we would call it like the Europe of capital. Let's say it like this, uh, to refer to my previous uh, weird distinction about Europe and the European Union. Let's see some aspects, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on which the European Union has structural characteristics, features, which are not only inherent in its uh, uh, character, in its constitution, but they are also addressed in its uh, uh, structural and uh, uh, initial uh, laws. So first, we have the financial and fiscal terms. I referred before to the fiscal stability pact. Maastricht Treaty, 6% GDP of uh, the debt of GDP, 3% of uh, the debt of GDP. And just to see how it's connected with the argument of Michael, I mean, this, this public debt. Public debt has been always used in the history of capitalism as a very, very useful means for capital to, to apply uh, you know, austerity in every uh, certain period, uh, especially in Europe. In political terms, yes, neoliberal is a certain uh, political project, as in academia, we, 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 you know, we describe it in academia like a project. <laughs> uh, so the whole neoliberal agenda, actually, was passed through the European Union directive. Uh, structural adjustment programs, actually, this, my first reference to this, that's very, very uh, uh, short, had four structural adjustment pro programs before uh, the, resolve, uh, the resolution of the crisis uh, in terms of IMF and uh, European Central Bank. We had privatizations, if any was there. Uh, and uh, like Simon said before, we cannot have renationalization of any activity, like rail, Eddie would argue, uh, within the European Union. This is addressed in the Constitution of the European Union. Uh, we have the argument of some, and let's open the debate. I mean, uh, we, shouldn't, we should be very clear. I mean, there is an argument from a European, from some UK, from some British left, that the EU has been protecting the working rights. Yes, we had 48 towns, uh, which was constituted by the European Union. Why? If you see the whole history of the European Union, we will refer uh, later what has happened in Austria uh, and, uh, and Hungary with Orban far right within the EU about working rights. So if you see in the, in the, in the history of the European Union, you have seen uh, driving wages, uh, wages down, sometimes increases, but always below the productivity and inflation growth, which means uh, you know, securing the profits of the corporations. Uh, we have flexible work, and we had done also within the European Union, in the UK, 2015, David Cameron, the anti-trade union uh, law. Within the European Union, 50% uh, minimum uh, you know, participation in the trade unions in order, in every ballot, in order the decision to be valid. Educational terms, we have the Bologna directives, we have, uh, you know, uh, degrees with much less rights than before. We have more specialized graduates, which means that when the economy changes in the future, they will be in much, much more difficult uh, position uh, you know, compared to whether they would have a much more comprehensive and uh, integrated uh, uh, 
uh, degree, and we have assessments of the universities and the research according to economic uh, and private uh, terms. Then we have the migration terms, which is a very interesting point, especially within the UK. Uh, I think that if we take it from the initial point, migration is not a nice thing. If you ask all the migrants, most of them will tell you that I didn't want to move. So the argument that is missing from the whole discussion in the whole European Union about migration of people is that people are obliged actually to move. Yeah. What has been happening is that the weak economies, before actually joining the European Union of the South, the periphery, Spain, Portugal, Greece, Cyprus, they had weak, they had several weaknesses, strong weaknesses. When, when they joined the European Union, these weaknesses actually expanded, they grew because of the open market. So when you open the market, the strong will get stronger, divergence, and the weak will get weaker, as Michael uh, described before. So uh, the economies of the South actually deregulated manufacturing, a special, you know, a specific uh, sector, which is quite important for a country, went from 30% in most of the peripheral countries to 10%, for instance, Greece. Yes, someone will say that we have this tertiarization of the economy, but still, this deregulation of the markets of the of the quick economies of the South within the European Union, in the open market of the European Union, was very important. So when these economies were deregulated, people were obliged, didn't want actually. If you ask the people here, okay, it's after the crisis, but some people were also before before the crisis here. If you ask the people, they were obliged to move to the core economies where they work under much worse working rights than they would be working back in their countries before their economies were deregulated. And on the opposite direction, we have migration of, 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 of people from the periphery to the core, and in the opposite direction, we have migration, direct investment, as uh, Michael said, from the core to the periphery, where all these multinational companies, I mean, the German clothing companies, mm. destroyed the clothing uh, industry in the north and east. Uh, back in the 1990s. And they were actually hiring people in much worse terms than, uh, than beforehand. So in this way, corporations shift labor across countries, they, and they actually seek and manage, actually, uh, deeper exploitation of the people. And uh, to, to, to finish with the, with the migration, remind me about this open EU. And another example within the EU, in the UK, remind me all this discussion about the migrants' rights in the Cameroon Syria. I mean, uh, these benefits, if you want, probably all of you, you have an example of a new migrant actually asking benefits and actually being denied within the EU, in the UK of Cameroon, which also relates to the argument of, okay, it's not only the EU. Then we have the imperialist role of the European Union, which is sometimes forgotten. You know, some people are very uh, enthusiastic, very happy, yes, within the European Union, all the EU countries have stopped fighting each other, which is nice for the European people. But at the same time, European Union has been a major imperialist uh, power in the whole world with invasions, which actually caused these huge refugee flows, and which actually uh, uh, implies concentration centers in Greece. Seven dead people, the last, the last thing on Tuesday in Greece, we can, I mean, uh, the number is, 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 is huge in the last three years. And all this discussion about the Europe fortress, we have front police in the borders of the European Union, which is a very probably, uh, uh, you know, not, not, not good uh, situation. And the basic thing that I had described before with the migration, the basic terms of the European Union has a structural character that cannot be resolved in this inherent division between core and periphery. Um, so I will not describe it again what happened with the migration. Uh, for me, it was the EU has had an important role in the deindustrialization of of uh, of the countries, of all the countries, with all this uh, finance, towards financial financial financialization, financialization uh, trends in the economy, and that's important also from the uh, you know uh, in terms of social resistance because manufacturing, and that's there is evidence there, manufacturing is uh, characterized from a specific <coughs> social solidarity. So the main strikes, the main working struggles in the history of the labor movement has been always, more or less, with some exceptions, uh, you know, emerging in the manufacturing sector, miners, 
are so many examples in so many uh, countries. So if I remember when I was writing the PhD thesis, sorry for my small, uh, small, small uh, example experience evidence, uh, I was trying to conceptualize the European Union in a way, you know, two, three uh, sentences, and, you know, to see who is actually benefiting, who is losing. I think that EU is integration of capital that benefits actually the economies as a whole, mainly of the core, while the economies as a whole, not the people, not the working, not the working class uh, people uh, of the periphery is actually, uh, are actually the losers, the losers while uh, the working class in both core and periphery are the main losers. Uh, so, uh, in addition to this, I mean, okay, capital is actually the big winner with deeper exploitation of the working class and migrants. In addition to this, we have Eurozone. I don't want to refer uh, to develop much more than uh, what Michael said. I would just like to say that it actually deepens the austerity. It's not, uh, I mean, the, the, the financial, the fiscal terms of the Eurozone become even, became even stricter, apart from the things that, uh, you know, the, the, the conditions that national states didn't have their currency, could not devalue, you know, make it more to their products, more competitive, that's a more, you know, economist, uh, economistic uh, discussion. But actual austerity in the Eurozone has been driving wages even more down. It has increasing, it has been increasing subprime lending. That's very important. This is why, like uh, Mike said before, uh, the household debt, it's made the household debt in Greece increase from 30% of GDP to 90% uh, seven years after the Eurozone, before the crisis, 2001, 2008. Yeah. So people with lower interest rates, uh, with the austerity, they tried uh, to borrow, uh, to borrow, and to borrow more. Uh, so, the open borders, the integration, the flows are all for the capital. And this is what should be our argument to the left spectrum, to the left, uh, you know, to the left, uh, to the left ideas, to the left groups that are actually afra afraid of speaking about the EU. That's, that's one uh, thing that I realized in my seven years in the UK that several political groups in the left, while probably in their structure, their ideas, they are anti European. They were actually afraid of speaking about this in the everyday political life, which means complete, uh, you know, um, divergence between the tactics and the strategy. We forget the strategy; we focus only on the tactics. So, the main question is then: What do we want? Whether we want a Europe of capital or, or a Europe of people? That, that's the most important question that we need yeah. uh, to address. So, if we want. A better society, I think, nobody in this, in this room should be in favor of the European Union as, uh, as a structure. And what has happened to the European Union until now, which is a very, very concerning issue, unfortunately, all this dissatisfaction about the European Union, which exists in every European Union member state, has been unfortunately uh, absorbed by the far-right uh, parties, by the people that uh, promise in this speak in the name of national democracy, uh, sovereign states, etc. Why? Two reasons for me. First, the left have uh, a huge possibility. The, the weakness of the left uh, have been um, uh, most obvious than ever in this struggle. Uh, most of them have been afraid, actually, to speak about this anti-European Union uh, narr narrative, while most EU left support, actually, the European Union as a structure, and they actually get more and more uh, loss, lo losses. So what happened in Greece, that's my only reference about Greece. If you ask 35 people in this room, if they were surprised, actually, by this uh, decision of Tsipras <laughs> after the referendum, they would probably, some of them would probably say, that, yes, that, that was surprising. Mm -hmm. For me, I, it wasn't surprising for me at all. So knowing the Greek stuff, stuff quite, uh, quite well, and knowing that Syriza is a, is a very pro-European Union party, for me, it was certain that all these promises, all these narratives that we are anti EU state, we can apply these issues within the European Union, cannot happen if you cannot break uh, with the European Union. And the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the final outcome was the minus 11% of, in the Euro elections of this party uh, in May, which is actually, uh, you know, uh, Greek people punish them, but the main issue about the Greek political story is that the whole left has been losing from this stuff. 
because Syriza has been speaking in the name of all the left. Uh, so this absorption, the second reason about the absorption of dissatisfaction of, uh, of, uh, about the EU from uh, the far right is also a strategy of capital. So what capital did, and uh, this narrative was very, very obvious and evident in the recent European uh, elections debate. So when uh, capital saw that there is a, you know, we have seen it in other uh, crises in the past of capitalism, this far right increase after the crisis, when capital actually saw this increase in the whole European Union, in the first years after the crisis, they actually, uh, you know, uh, pushed this dilemma in its extreme and actually uh, asked the people before the Euro elections, do you want uh, the European Union of these neoliberal ex-social democrat uh, forces, uh, or the unified EU, or do you want the divided Euro, you know, in terms of these uh, far-right nationalist ideas? So, regardless of the rhetoric of the far right, we know that the agenda, uh, the agenda of the far right is always serving the capital. And let me say just two examples about uh, European Union countries. So, in Austria, within the European Union, Kurds, the right, uh, the right wing guy with the far right in the government, they uh, they regulated 12 hours working day in Austria within the European Union. And that's an argument, that's a counter argument about this idea of many British left that, yes, the EU is a protector, is actually protecting the working class. A second example, Orban within the EU, as they try to probably to, to, that he's out of the conservative uh, family in the European Union terms, within the EU, he actually voted in Hungary uh, the law 400 hours of overtime annually compulsory. And then the people who actually the workers who are uh, you know working in 400 hours overtime, they will be paid after actually negotiations with the bosses. So this is actually the far right, and mm -hmm. we need to be very clear. It targets actually the foreign workers. It's actually raised against the poor, and it actually seeks to destroy the whole working class. Probably uh, seeking to uh, renegotiate the position of uh, the upper class of its country within the European Union. So in the UK, uh, in my last part, uh, in the last part of my speech, in the UK we have seen several unions, uh, like Eddie would say probably, that they have been opposing the European Union from its certain foundations, the RMT uh, and other smaller unions. However, the bigger umbrellas, the bigger unions like Unite, Unison, they have been very clear in the referendum. They have been actually supporting the Remain in the argument that you know we cannot actually. Uh, do not actually trust a Tories government that will probably uh, promise a better, um, a better future uh, out of the European Union uh, because of this working rights argument, which I actually showed before that it's not so strong. Uh, so, apart from the examples of Austria and Hungary, there is we can see a certain lack of the left at the moment, or of the union of the labor movement. So apart from the question whether we can protect actually these 48 hours that the EU regulates, there is a question what we want, whether we want a labor movement, a strong labor movement that will go not from 48 limit, but from the 35 working hours uh, in the week to 25 to 20 to 15. So we can see that there is a complete, a, complete, a relative lack of the voice of the labor movement, you know, in order to attack, in order to be in the front uh, of, uh, of the struggles. And in my opinion, as I said before, the left, most of the left have been actually quite afraid within the, Euro within the UK, let's specify, uh, to speak about the, Euro yeah, the European Union because they would be considered as uh, racist. And the outcome has been a, a complete, you know, uh, ignorance of what what is happening inside? They were focusing only on the austerity. They never actually, you know, targeted the main, the, the main objectives and decisions of capital, and they could not even condemn political the European Union in the everyday, everyday political life. And the referendum, some of them went to the remain, saying that you cannot pass and uh, uh, now for an exit from the European Union. That for me was, uh, you know, it's like. I will not go to the elections because my program will not be voted. So it's something similar. So why cannot, you know, we cannot uh, the left or a specific group throw their ideas to the people, fight for them, and then be always there? And that situation get even worse after the, the referendum. I was part of, we were part of the Lexit campaign, uh, Andersia. 
After the 23rd of June, there was a complete, a complete uh, lack of its existence. We don't know where these people are. We don't know where the left, the major left is actually, in this uh, big struggle of what Brexit we want. And uh, unfortunately, the discourse has been dominated by others. At the top of this, we have seen several uh, people voting, supporting uh, the Brexit party of Farage, we should not forget who is the leader uh, in the recent Euro elections. So uh, what should we do? Addressing these uh, three, uh, three positions about the EU remain, let's not focus on this, uh, or let's, let's see what the EU is. I think that we need to demand immediately in every European Union member state an internationalist, working class, migrants friendly overthrow of the whole European Union. And even some comrades in Adarsia or in sometimes, you know, in our everyday uh, uh, leaflets, we forget actually to say that we want the overthrow of the European Union. Sometimes we just say that we, uh, we are against the European Union, we want uh, uh, Greece out of the EU. But I mean, the major, the major, uh, uh, you know, the key factor in this struggle is that there, there should be a pan European, a European wide uh, movement, labor movement, in my opinion, that would ask us, that would demand actually uh, as the overthrow of the European Union in internationalist working class and migrant friendly terms. Uh, and because, as I started my, uh, my, <laughs> my speech, you need always to, to, to connect tax, tactics, and strategy. And because Michael has his argument, Brexit, uh, Brexit sorry, uh, the overthrow of the EU will not bring, uh, you know, immediately out of the rule like this. Uh, a better future. So you need to combine uh, this uh, demand about overthrowing the European Union with, either, with other wider and immediate uh, measures that will relieve the working class, like uh, writing off the public debt, uh, better salaries, more decent jobs against the fascist, against the far right, um, uh, you know, uh, public health and educational system, system nationalization of the banking sector and major industries in its country. So the EU is a sufficient, is, is not a sufficient step, but is necessary towards this anti-capitalist strategy, in my opinion. So questioning the EU should be always associated with the bigger question, who owns the economy? We cannot forget that. We cannot just go on the EU, etc. forget the major question, as uh, Michael uh, said uh, before. Uh, last thing, how to do it. Some small ideas from my experience in the, EU, in the UK. Sorry. Uh, I remember we should be always also uh, you know, clear and actually uh, uh, evaluating, assessing our actions. Uh, we were uh, thinking to have an anti EU summit in Athens back in 2013. And I was speaking with some comrades in Athens, and they told me, can you find some people that are anti EU in, uh, in the UK? Maybe you know this guy. I met uh, John Kaif uh, from, uh, sorry, John Boyd from Kaif, campaign against the uh, Euro Federalist. He, he was uh, an ex communist, ex SWP member. And uh, in the end, he said, yes, I'm very anti EU. Eventually, he supported the Leave campaign, the, the, not the good cause. Uh, so, and he told me, which is uh, one of the main issues in the story, I cannot speak in the name of the whole European nations. I cannot say overthrow of the EU. I cannot, I can just say the, the UK out of the European Union, which also connects, which also connects with the issue of sovereign uh, states and national democracy. So in my opinion, and that was the conclusion of the previous five years ago uh, event of the Andersia UK, which when we had the comrades from Greece and Belgium, is that we go, we need, uh, uh, so we don't need to go from the top. We need bottom-up initiatives. So we, we need anti-EU initiatives in every European Union member state, which will have this kind of, in my opinion, which have this kind, kind of character as I described before, which will then merge all together in an anti-EU, pan-European, European-wide uh, uh, labor uh, movement. This will highlight, highlight the wider role of the EU, <coughs> This will weaken far right and nationalist ideas, and this will connect the fight with a wider anti capitalist struggle. I think we still have time in the UK. I mean, you know, all the time in these three years, sorry, uh, we, we, we say, where is the left? Where are the, where are the left voices in terms of Brexit? Well, what's happening? I mean, I think that the left needs a little more imagination. We need to actually vision, vision in certain terms, 
another type of society and economy. And actually, we need to get stronger from the actual result of the referendum, per se, in the UK. Uh, but we need the left to start mobilizing the working class, not leaving this duty, which is very important to other people with very bad uh, consequences. So to finish, many times we postpone this, uh, discussions about Oh, the European Union revolution, it will happen in the future. Hey, let's postpone it. Let's not speak about it now. Uh, the big social change. But, you know, like this cannot happen anytime, which is a, a big weakness of, of, of the left in pan-European level. So the labor movement history has shown that it's not a linear, uh, you know, a trend, but it has wide fluctuations. So we need always to be ready. However, this is... Uh, it's not the EU topic is not something that will happen in the future. It's actually happening at the moment, and the left is again absent. So the dilemma remains in the EU or a Brexit under Tories. For me, is fake. Uh, I mean, we just need to respond immediately. We need to bring a third factor, a third pole into the game. We need to act now to mobilize the working class in this anti-EU, uh, European-wide perspective. And you know, because history. Uh, we, once again, probably will not treat both the society and the left in a good way. And I think that there, was, there is always time that we can always win in this struggle. Thank you. So this goes to the speakers for this uh, today's meeting. We have the room for around two hours, so it's up to you people to get in the discussion and chat. Uh, I would like to say that uh, the speakers who will have the chance to uh, make a closing argument, like uh, uh, expected amount of time at the end of the meeting. So I would uh, recommend that they should uh, keep their arguments for the latest uh, time. So it's up to you. Hi. Hi. You also have the left. Having the left is very divided in Britain, so I'm sure you're aware. Uh... And in the comments I make, I'm probably not going to refer to the man police because I think there is a different situation, a different kind of a movement, um, and it's very and it's not one of the world's oh, it's not the world's oldest imperialist power, which Britain is, which completely changes. I, I'm, there'll be parallel. So yeah, I'm from a group called the Revolutionary Communist Group in Britain, and we are on the left. And a lot of what I say will reflect our position because we, we we're not we we're not wishy washy about not supporting either a Brexit or the main. We actually think that is the cost of, of communists in this country. This is a struggle between sections of the ruling class. They are tearing themselves to pieces in both parties over this question, over the future path of British imperialism. They are in a crisis and they don't know what to do. And we believe that the obligation on socialists is to look at the independent interests of the working class and not to take sides on this particular argument. Um, totally agree with your characterization of Europe. It is a racist, imperialist bloc um, set up to um, challenge US dominance, um, not also Eastern dominance, but as you mentioned, but particularly to set up as a challenge. And indeed, one of these days it hopes to have its own army and not be reliant on NATO as well. And it is a monster. But um, Britain was forced to go into it. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about neoliberalism. I have a problem with the concept of neoliberal capitalism. I don't think it's neoliberal capitalism. I think it's capitalism. Capitalism in a period of imperialism when it is in crisis and it must do what it is doing. It isn't that like around the corner there's a nicer form of capitalism. I don't know, maybe invented by Jeremy Corbyn or, some, or someone like that. This is what capitalism must do. And you could talk back to the 1970s. I think mean, people have mentioned Reagan and Thatcher. And all of these have been desperate attempts by capitalism in the face of the re-emergence of a crisis that was briefly staged, staged off in the post-war period um, of trying to find a way to develop productive forces in a way it can no longer do because it is an imperialist, parasitic, decaying system and no one is that more true in Britain. So when we talk about Britain and sovereignty for Britain and pulling out of the EU, we have to remember what is Britain and what would Britain alone be? And Britain alone I mean, everyone knows it doesn't have manufacturing or industry or productive anything really going on. It has overseas assets, i.e., it makes its money by exploiting the rest of the world, and we need to remember that. And it has the city of London, which has the export of financial services. And that is what Britain really is. And it's probably no longer enough for it to exist as an independent power. Yeah. It has to be a junior class. I mean, 
and some would describe as the Greater Guernsey, we're talking about offshore tax havens, <laughs> but that would be a junior sort of partner of the US, but essentially an offshore tax haven. That is the future for it. And my problem with your argument, which sounds very nice about how we should, however, we should, you know, we should mobilize around pulling out the EU on a progressive platform. There is no progressive platform in this country, really, on any wide sense at the moment. It's what kind of, you were talking about before the referendum, but I say before the election of Corbyn, actually. There were struggles popping up here and there. There was stuff going on in housing. It might not be huge, but it was enthusiastic and angry and it was growing. And I think, in fact, in the election of Corbyn, the head of the Labour Party, suddenly sucked all that energy up with people believing that somehow that would lead them to the promised land. And in this country, we're going to say, so I, for me, the Lexit, the left exit from EU, the building around that, is a fantasy. It is the, the Lexit argument, the, the Brexit argument is absolutely, in this country, a reactionary one. The EU is a reactionary one as well. I'm not, so let's take, let's take it for granted. The EU is reactionary racist force. No one should support it. But the uh, Leave campaign is actually founded in this country on racism. Um, on these ideas of a sovereign imperialist British victim. I do not see why we would concern ourselves with that argument. Let them tear themselves to pieces. We should be building a movement in solidarity with migrants. Absolutely. We should be building a movement for housing and demanding something better than we've got and keep taking over some of those empty houses that exist. We should be arguing against the gig economy, low wages, um, everything that's going on. I absolutely am with you. But I do not think the argument about Europe for people in Britain is a relevant one. I think we should be building that movement and fighting those things. And you know, if we build a big enough movement, well, then it either would come out of Europe or we'll try and transform Europe. But the, the game would be a different game altogether anyway. I think it is a dis it's not it's an important question because it's about the future of British imperialism, but it is not a question for the working class to take sides on in this country. Thank you. Uh, it's a comment here and then the link. Yeah. You. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Um, sorry, I'll, I'm also a member of the Revolutionary Communist Group. I just wanted to add to this. Um, you probably said a lot of things that I was going to say as well. But um, essentially, yeah, I think I did notice that when we were talking about this, we're often talking about um, EU imperialism, which we mentioned, uh, and, and US imperialism, and even uh, Japanese imperialism. But we do need to recognise Britain as, the, as an imperialist power. It's, it's obviously its assets are five times its GDP still. It, it's, it's a major exporter of finance capital. Um, it remains a major, a major global imperialist power. And every political development that happens within Britain is an expression of that. And that is the reason why we have so little uh, movement on the left on these issues like housing and the basic independent interests of the working class and all the energy we into um, the, the Brexit debate at the moment. Um, the reason that the, the Labour Party, for example, has been forced to um, take sides in this Brexit debate, um, despite much you know, kind of ambiguity over the, over the period, it's, it's now being essentially forced into a remain position. Um, it's known that sort of, well, even before um, Corbyn took the lead of the Labour Party, about 60% of its members were pro remain, and now the figure is more like 80%. Um, it's because Labour has always been, as as a as the leading um, section of the Labour movement in Britain, as an imperialist country for its entire history, it has represented um, the better off layers of the working class in this country who benefit from Britain's uh, position as a as a uh, its monopoly position as an imperialist power, and um, this is why it has had to align itself with whatever the interests are of that section and increasing the interests of the of working in Britain. It's not just because of um, liberalism or whatever that means, but their, their material interests as a privileged layer of the working class are aligned with um, with staying in the EU in order to secure their interests and offer them the kind of standard of living that they have previously like trying to preserve that. Um, and I think you know that kind of points to the way that if we are defending independent interests of the working class, um, you have to look beyond the, the interests of a privileged player and look at the struggles that are taking place, often against, you know, particularly when it comes to housing, often against the Labour Party, local councils that are led by the Labour Party, which are, you know, selling off um, uh, council-owned land.
dams, which is demolished and built on housing, you know, often it is against that um, layer that they're struggling. So I think that points the way in a more practical sense is what we need to do is to is to um, break in the low five. <laughs> Eleni? I think we can all agree that things such as flexible working habits, the zero hours of hours contract, and overall the precarious situation of employees, or <laughs> the dismantling of pensions, as it happened over the past few years, and sometimes it's right that the universities last year, but universities are not the only place where we have moved in a very aggressive way from defining uh, benefits and defined contributions, or where pension schemes have been dismantled completely in the UK for some time now. It's not a new thing, by the way. I think we'll agree they are major issues for the working movement in the UK. Of course, it's not UK EU directly. And no one ever said anything about that. Not even you see you last year when your own Liberal Square said anything about the fact that this is actually being imposed by an EU directive. The flexible working hours are one of the flexible employment schemes and even international policies. That is never been mentioned. <coughs> so I would actually argue that the way the EU is being organised actually does affect the rights of the working people. And there is plenty of scope of actually highlighting how these things happen here and actually making the work of people who are good on the grounds of what these policies are within the EU. The EU for the work of people in Britain is not something that happens in some, to someone else. It's something that happens that happens here to us, to all of us, regardless of nationality or immigration status, that work here. And this hasn't been highlighted. And this is where I become sometimes a bit annoyed with this thing. But then again, that's you know, stereotypes of different life forms. If anything, when it comes to the EU, we're not going to be able to organize any kind of movement unless we find these policies that can unite people against the policies that I don't know what you want to call them, you call them whatever you want, but essentially increase exploitation and reduce the rights of working people. And we have had more institutional changes in the way legislation has applied to political parties, and we've also had financial issues that have to do with the way the pilots are written and that kind of thing. So for me, it's important that if we want to fight for our good, we actually don't just compartmentalize the way that, in a way, capitalism works in Europe, but try and find a unifying path. And I wrote two examples for India at the probably find many more. I think the pensions directives over the past 10, 20 years, and actually it's not 10, it's a bit less. And the flexible working patterns that came from the Lisbon Agreement and further through legislation were implemented are quite a good example to get started. Thank you. Question. I've seen it, no one else. I would like to say a few things. Um, so I would like to do, uh, my comment is based on my uh, personal experience. And I would like to say that uh, we are, the audience is uh, in majority Greek. So the, the only good thing that this has is that it has a, let, a bit of perspective and people are not so consumed in um, local, uh, the local mm -hmm. difficulties. But yeah. I think that the main point of this discussion is not to just uh, show a different point of view, but uh, to find a common ground where we can work uh, locally, not about a different country or not about anything else. Uh, so I would like to say in uh, goodwill that uh, I disagree with the way that a lot of local uh, organizations on the left consider the issue. And I can say that in a bit of, uh, with a bit of safety because I, I, used to, I used to be the one in Greece always saying uh, it's wrong to speak about the European Union solely without uh, raising the reactionary way people can speak about it. Uh, in Greece, it's exactly the opposite thing that here. Usually, people are so consumed in saying uh, things against the European Union that sometimes it's not transitional. Uh, transitional. It's like uh, it's enough for someone to be considered left-wing if we, they are against the European Union. And I used to be the annoying person, always saying it's not enough. We have to say more things about the European Union. Um, I can say that I, with some degree of, degree of safety that when I came here, I went to the Catalonia campaign 
uh, March or yeah or March. Uh, people were confused as well because they raised uh, the Catalonian flag along with the European Union flag together. And there, I had to say, guys, this is, I mean, they are... And in Scotland. It was in Scotland, oh, actually. Uh, same yeah, thing. This happened in Glasgow. So, mm. um, so I have to say that there is um, a true way. I, I would like to say that uh, there must be a, a sincere, a, a good way to pose the issue, to, to raise it without being in one of the two uh, bad ways. And this place, <laughs> I, I, I would consider that this way uh, is the only uh, the, the only good way that you can raise issues to consider it as a transitional demand and to consider that it's uh, connected with uh, local government policies. And it's not a far away a foreigner or someone else that tries to implement something and you want to raise your own um, reactionary self against them but it's uh, your own local council that is aligned with the European Union. So you actually raise a whole bunch of issues together, not just one separate. I hate uh, the French guys. It's not uh, it's reactionary. And I think that there is a paradox that uh, I uh, found when I spoke with European left groups. <coughs> and you, you could say that, uh, I don't know if you have any experience with different organizations around Europe, uh, there is something that is quite strange is that in Denmark, uh, people are quite against the EU in a good way. And they are, I would say, consumed by liberal left as British people are. But for some reason, for traditional, uh, because of tradition, they are against the EU. Um, <coughs> at the same time, French organizations that are very radical and there is an active class struggle going on and they are, their lives are in the class struggle, it's not uh, that the way of life of a uh, French militant is totally different than uh, the way of life of British militant or U any kind of European uh, activist. Uh, their their um, touch in the EU issue is that we don't talk about it because it's reactionary usually. Uh, and you can see all these bands, of <coughs> you can see people from different directions having totally different um, uh, ways that they raise it. And I can say that I disagree with the way that the British people raise it. I disagree with the way that the French people raise it. But uh, sometimes it's not, uh, I, I understand that in France, maybe it's not uh, what should be governing everyday class struggle. But uh, I, <coughs> that's what I want to say to the local leftists here, local leftists here is, what can you do about it? I, I, get, I do get it that you, it's not so convenient to talk about it. It's, yeah, it's like not an uneasy situation. So what? I mean, people discuss about it. So you have to, uh, there's no other way to get around that. I mean, you get to, uh, you have to speak about the European Union here. I mean, we just, I, it happened that we are Greeks and we had to speak about the issue there. It happened to be in Britain. We have to speak about it here and we will. I will not go into escape uh, the situation. Um, so I would like to say that it should be connected as a whole bunch of, uh, demands, not just a separate one. Otherwise, it is, it, it's going to be reactionary in any way. And it's going to be, uh, I think the core, the core is keep it uh, connected to your local government, even your local city council. Keep it, keep it as local as you can and keep it as connected and as broad as you can. Uh, from, any, uh, from any aspect, from uh, the migrant situation or even the lo lately hotter issue, ecology, uh, European Union is uh, on the other side uh, against us. So, yeah, uh, I would like to, to, to provoke this chat between us, but local, uh, that's what I want to get from the discussion. What do we say here? Okay. Sorry, I just, um, I was thinking about it, when you started speaking, I apologize, I forgot to give my hand up before. So I'm also a member of the, of the social housing. And I was just picking up on this issue about not being able to talk about it, because I think it's become so polarised and it becomes an emotional issue, um, talking about Brexit. You can't really talk about it without being either translated one way or the other. So therefore, there hasn't become, the left hasn't had an argument, which I, I totally agree with this, you know, where, where is the alternative vision? There's no alternative, there's no other ways of looking at it. And I don't really have a position in the sense that I don't really have, I'm not pro Brexit and I'm not pro the EU massively either. But there doesn't seem to be anything else. There's no other vision. I mean, what we do in architecture for social housing is put forward an alternative to demolition of housing states. We can't just say, no, don't, don't demolish. 
um, because you have to put forward something else in its place, and it just doesn't seem to be. Uh, and, it, and I, I'm kind of bemused by that. I don't really understand because I was always under the impression, kind of, which I imagine quite a few people are, that probably Jeremy Corbyn himself may have certain views <laughs> in that direction. But you know, there's just no voice out there, and it does seem to be kind of extraordinary. And I also agree with you that potentially the, the Brexit debate has completely destroyed the whole conversation about austerity and issues around housing, yeah, the poor housing yeah. crisis. It, all those kind of exactly. discussions have been shut down and Brexit has taken over. And you're absolutely right, it's not it's not the all and end all. Brexit is not gonna fucking solve excuse me, solve all of our problems. Um, um, but the other things are not being discussed. And and it's been really refreshing to hear this conversation today. Actually I've really enjoyed all the points that have been made. It's been really, really interesting. And I'm gonna if this is the important to share this with people who I think uh, are not they're putting their fingers in their ears and not really interested to listen. Um, and I think maybe that's got to do with um, I don't know, our press, possibly, but the emotive way in which, you know, if you're talking about me, if you're talking about the anti-EU, yes, it's either a racist or you're stupid. <laughs> Obviously, don't understand what amazing thing the EU is to the organisation. And I think the kind of lack of understanding and the lack of critique and the lack of sharing of information on basic levels, and what does EU directives actually do? What other roles are it? The, the lack of knowledge that we have is, uh, seems to be extraordinary. Um, so it's not really a question, it's just a statement. Can I say something about it? Um, you were sort of paint, I think we all agreed that um, neoliberalism, if you want to call it, monopoly capitalism, a certain stage, you know, I only use the term because it's the one I want, but is, I think it's a bizarre term anyway, um, is not the same thing as the, the European Union. But when, when you kind of describe, Michael, when you describe that kind of post war period and uh, I guess neoliberalism rising as a political philosophy or economic philosophy during the 70s when capitalism went into a sort of a crisis. Um, and I kind of agree with your term that capitalism was always, you know, there's no kind of better version of capitalism which existed. Might have been better for us in the 60s or something like that, but not for everyone else in the, in the whole sort of world. Yeah, all for you. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I don't know, I'd say, you know, maybe. What I'm trying to say, leaving the EU might be a necessary set, step. We all accept it's not a sufficient step to overcome. And I really like your idea that leaving is actually not the issue. It's actually overthrowing, I think. Is, is a, that's something I really like as well. But the, the, the European Union, you know, as it kind of slowly emerged from the Second World War, it was also very much a political project. And one of its, one of its frameworks was to combat the attraction, the moral, if you like, social attraction of socialism in the Eastern Europe. It wasn't just about combating uh, US imperialism, and it was certainly before the rise of, kind of you know, uh, Japan as, a, as an economic power. It was about kind of creating a, an alternative oppositional narrative to the attraction of socialism and the very real threat it presented uh, to kind of Western democracies. And I think the whole, um, uh, the kind of the discourse of human rights and the way it supplanted socialism as a kind of a, uh, a framework for moral justice, which you were very critical of, you know, we deal with, we look all the time at kind of rights, you know, within housing, right to return, all this sort of stuff. And it's all, you know, it's all bollocks. It doesn't actually guarantee anything at all. Human rights within a capitalist system aren't worth anything at all. So I, I don't, I'm, what I'm trying to get at here is I, the more and more, I, I, as I've been kind of looking at this, or forced to look at it really, because I just, I actually didn't vote, you know, too busy looking at bloody housing and how to kind of save social housing in UK policy. I actually didn't vote in the referendum, but it's, it's sort of come up more and more and more and more. And I've been forced to kind of look at it. Um, I think we do need to I guess, leave to overthrow it. Although, Jesus Christ, I mean, the, the, the platform for that doesn't exist at all. No. Certainly in this country at all. You know, we're kind of like, maybe we could actually make an argument, a left argument. That hasn't been made at all. Um, you know, neoliberalism or whatever you want to call it is such a dominant uh, force, I think. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, I try to, I guess, in, in my talk, talk about... What is the actual, you know, if we go away from the big kind of stuff here, from the big kind of strategy to the individual tactics, does the membership of the EU prohibit actually make it impossible to do certain things, not at the, ter not at the kind of the level of, you know, overthrow, you know, this, this brilliant kind of description that you had, which I, I really like, kind of a pan-European anti or overthrow of European. It's a great, great vision. I love it. Um, I wish I thought of it, but um, <laughs> but we're you know at the moment we're trying to think of you know how do we stop all this money coming in to financialize UK housing or something like that. So, you know I really like your your distinction between 
the strategic and the tactical level. And at the moment, from what I understand, there are a bunch of EU directives, which the uh, lady up there, the comrade in the, in the corner, talks about, which prohibit even those very, very first steps happening. And because of that, I think we need to, that is the first insufficient but necessary step to get out of it. So I kind of disagree with your position that this is not a debate um, that the working class should be getting involved with. I think, I think they should. Yeah, I'll, I will give it uh, democratically. I will speak, people will speak that haven't spoken first. So it's yours and then comment there. Uh, I'll address the question, not to a specific speaker, but to all of you who are welcome to answer. Uh, in my point of view, uh, the three main groups, if I can cluster them in the European Union currently, uh, are uh, three. Let's say the main one uh, is Germany, where uh, the future of the EU is described with, uh, let's say, a deepening in, more, in both uh, political and financial terms, uh, the European Union as a structure. Uh, another major group is, uh, let's say, one with the most representative countries and being uh, France, uh, where, let's say, they, they want a different mixture in the financial politics, and but however, they accept, let's say, the, the deepening in the political sector. And uh, there is another group which is small with some countries, let's say, the former Eastern Bloc, uh, where uh, they, let's say, accept uh, the deepening in the financial terms, but let's say because of their far right governments and uh, this kind of uh, anti-immigrant politics and all that stuff, uh, they don't want uh, the deepening of the political side of the European Union. In the end of the day, all of uh, those groups, let's say, are aggressed against uh, the British right. Uh, the left-wing uh, anti-Asian groups will continue their struggle. They don't have to join discussions with uh, these political currents. Uh, but, uh, the ruling classes have to find their way to move forward the European Union as a structure. So, how do you think, um, all of you, will this uh, process uh, continue? I mean, what's going to be the compromise? Because sometimes in Greece, uh, let's say, people, it's more easy for them to imagine the dissolvement of the European Union because of the internal disagreements between the ruling classes, uh, rather than by a pan European working class uh, movement. Which that for its rights. So we, we have to discuss about uh, this kind of the future of the European Union. Also, I want your opinion. Um, the main, yes, about two areas I want to touch upon. First of all, in terms of how the left used to be the kind of dominant force against the European Union. I think we kind of lost, um, and it's not necessarily in terms of discussions around the EU membership in the 70s, but I'm talking more to the 90s and early 2000s. There was a Euro Marshes by about 96, 97, which was a movement of social movement, progressive um, trade unions and youth, which were uh, looking at the kind of the, you know, right to parity and social exclusion, but specifically about the social exclusion of the South Mediterranean countries. And this was, I think, a really kind of crucial moment, which is kind of been lost in our kind of popular history about, you know, the emphasis was never, in my mind, um, and I was involved in a few anti-EU mobilizations in the early 2000s, um, it wasn't against um, the new membership, it was against the EU because it was, it acted as this, um, this body like what well, trade organization, like the G8, like the World Bank, IMF, that was to, you know, project the neoliberal politics onto, onto European uh, citizens. And the response to that wasn't around what you're getting now, it's a very reactionary response from, I think, what uh, Brexit has done is made, it's exposed how reactionary the left is, you know, in terms of from the Leave campaign, the left Leave campaign, as well as the, re the left Remain campaign. Um, and reactionary in the sense that um, the whole essence in terms of how social movements were operating despite the European Union was the fact that they were, they were organizing across borders. And if the emphasis is the lack of organizing across borders, then this is a problem. This is the actual project that we should be looking at and not an anti EU project. You know, the main fundamental role for 
those of us that um, yes, describe kind of evolutionary perspective is to look at the contours of class struggle, and that's the, the defining factor. Everything else, for sure, is conditioned in terms of the Bologna process on education, you directed in terms of um, in, in, uh, in the UK, but so, many, so do other kind of policies mm -hmm. which affect how we struggle and the conditions we struggle. And I think there's an obsession around the European Union, which is what it's producing is reactionary nationalism on the left on how to deal with it. And I think it's, um, it's actually putting the left in crisis, in existential crisis, in terms of who is responsible. I've been in the UK since 1980. I'm still a Japan citizen, even though I grew up here. Um, and if you ask a European Union migrant, which is three, four million of us now in the UK, and ask, and these are you know, radicals, leftists, Hispanics, communists, and stuff, with their perspectives, it's going to diverge massively from the perspective of someone who's a UK citizen and on the left who's not this way and talks about everything else. So if, you're, if, someone, if people are arguing that we've got some sort of element of unity that's introduced amongst our class, I'll completely reject that idea. It's not, it's actually causing division. You know, mm -hmm. Brexit is, is one of the single most causes of fragmentation of working class interests, uh, you know, for the last couple of decades. So, and I really like uh, Michael's uh, presentation in the sense of Plan C has never taken a position about pro or against the uh, uh, Brexit at all. And I think the main, the main purpose we did that was in similar to what Michael was saying that. Or issues of crisis is one of the defining factors that the left had to tackle. Everything else is a symptom of that crisis, but until we find out the reasons why, for example, our ten years of austerity, uh, there's no workers' movement in the UK. Trade unionism is not workers' movement, it's a different form of uh, expressing the interests of labour, but it's not the same as the workers' movement. Where are the transnational movements? You know, where is the kind of Cross border solidarity movement, where the solidarity of migrants, you know, why haven't we kind of centered in this struggle with the main international class? And, and the thing is, if you're asking residents of the states going to be demolished or people like Brentford yesterday, what their view of Brexit is, it's going to be quite low down. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And fundamentally, it's a problem. People aren't involved in intense forms of class struggle, and this issue it doesn't seem to be at the time of the struggle that they somehow. If no, there's no one else, uh, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, say I don't agree. When you say, you know, you fall down to the house down, we find an alternative. That's because you want to save the house and it's in the interest of the working class to save the house. This, the, quest, the EU referendum question, the question was, which is the way forward for British imperialism? How can it best save itself? How would any of us want to answer that question for them? Let them remain in deadlock. Let it be a real problem. Let it paralyze the ruling class as long as it possibly can. <coughs> you know, this is our answer is socialism. I mean, in the end, our only answer can be a completely different way of doing things and overturning the system. But we're a long way from that at the moment. But we're not interested in their solutions and those solutions. I, when the comrade up there talks about, you know, this is an EU directive. Yeah, I bet it was. He was full of the action directive. And you, yeah. but you fight against them. You fight. You fight. It could have been someone else's directive. You would still fight against it. The point is that you fight against it. I mean, you know, I don't think the British government had any help thinking up or uh, slashing regulations on fire safety and all the red tape, throwing out red tape on that part that which had been laid out directly at you know the door for Grenfell. I don't think they had a lot of help coming up with the idea of universal credit and uh, enabling the way that you know consigns people to. On the prosecution and suicide, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, we mustn't pretend that Britain is doing these things because Europe is telling it to do these yes. things. It's doing it because it is a vicious, racist, anti working class country, desperate to try and claw back profit from wherever it can, cut provision for the working class, force more and more people down, make money by exploiting the working class around the world. And that's why I'm kind of focusing on, and the, the EU is not the cause of these things, it is the result of. Capitalist imperialist governments getting together and saying, How can we stand up in an era of inter imperialist rivalry and growing protectionism in Paris and all this escalating? How can we strengthen ourselves against the United States? So, I'm not defending the EU in this. I'm just saying, let's not pretend that the EU is the problem here because it really, really isn't going back to what the comrades over there said. 
you know, capitalism is the problem. Capitalism can no longer provide even for the working class in its own country, let alone for anybody else. And I just want to say on the housing thing, um, you say that you know you think it's a good thing to the price to I my feeling is it is very incredibly clear and it's to do with uncertainty. I think when um, certain families when properties have nowhere to invest in productive um, no room for productive investment then it's about land. And Australia, the United States, everywhere that is the case. The, the financialization of land and land as an asset and of land as a source of profit, I don't think is going away anytime soon. It will find a different way that's not via Europe. I, I kind of can't see that actually. Yeah, I think that's so, it's so fundamental at the moment to um, capitalist profits that I don't think that's actually going to be changing significantly. I don't see the significant relief to that. Michael? Yeah, I just wanted to, um, because I think Chair and uh, Nikki was saying that we need to try see if we can find some sort of common ground here about what direction to go in. So I'd just like to take up a few points that have been raised from the floor um, about how we can find some common ground, what direction we should take on the left. Um, because at the moment, uh, Comrade here says that British capital is divided. The British working class is divided on this question. They don't know what's best for, for the labor movement and for working people. Two thirds of the British working class don't think it's an issue. I'm quite happy to stay in the EU. Some of them more specifically want to stay in the EU. One third of the working class, particularly in poor towns in the north, in other areas, see, have been, or at least have been told, that the cause of all their of austerity, of the fact they don't have decent wages and their public services are down, is to do with the EU. Um, uh, although it's not, it's not very easy to explain why it is to do with the EU. I remember when there was a radio station immediately after the referendum said uh, to people who have voted leave in these northern towns, why did you vote uh, to leave the EU? Because, and some of them said, well, because I don't, there's too many immigrants from Eastern Europe here. here. But others said, because of EU regulations are, are stopping us. So the radio station interviewer said, well, which EU regulation don't you like? And they couldn't think of one because it's just an idea that the EU is regulating with straight bananas and the rest of it. Uh, their, their lies, which, of course, is not true. The EU directives, yes, they're neoliberal. Yes, they're uh, pro-capitalist. Yes, they're anti-labor movement. Do you know who the main pusher for the change in the EU directives and the direction of neoliberalism was? It was the British government. The British Tory government and the Blair governments afterwards were very much in favor of the American style, uh, neoliberal deregulation of the banks, deregulation of the labor movement, precarious employment and all the rest of it. Precarious employment is not restricted to the EU. It's restricted, it's across the board in the US, in Australia, everywhere. It's a policy and a development that's taken place in order to drive up profitability and exploit uh, labor more effectively. The EU is not a product, uh, is a product, is part of that process, but it's it's not the cause of it. Uh, Orban may be breaking the EU regulations and going for a 10 hour week, but he's doing it against, it just, he's doing it anyway, because that's what he wants to do. He wants to impose this neoliberal policy uh, in uh, inside Eastern Europe. So how do we bring things together? And it seems to me, the question is, we must oppose these policies. That's the, the policy that we must do, we must aim for. And we must do it, as has been said before, on a pan-European basis. We are against these measures. We want to restore public services. We want to take back control of the major sectors of the economy. In the case of Britain, that have been privatised, like railways, like water, like energy. I mean, it's just unbelievably scandalous. And above all, I'm actually, having worked 35 years in the finance sector, I'm absolutely amazed that we are not standing as a labor movement for the re taking over of all the banks and finance institutions in the country. That's a radical program. Now, the question then comes, if a government was in power that was prepared to implement that, after all, Syriza stood for all those things when the way back passed before it got to power, uh, if we had such a program, 
What would the EU do? Well, the EU wouldn't be very happy about it. The, and who are the EU? It's not, so, it's not just a few bureaucrats in Brussels. It's all the national capitalist governments of Germany, France, elsewhere, who are opposed <laughs> to those policies. If there were other socialist governments in Europe, maybe they would appear, but they would be in opposition then to the major capitalists. There would be a division within the EU. All EU directives are not set by EU bureaucrats. They're a product of the policies of the national governments of the EU, because that's what it is. It's still a, a, a cabal of national capitalist governments working in the interest. So the, this is the common ground for me, is the common ground is the program to change the system, not only in the UK, but in Europe, in the interests of the labor movement, along the lines, briefly, that I've described towards full employment, uh, decent working hours, better public services, nationalization of the major industries and banks so that we can plan production on a European-wide basis. That seems to me a program of unity. If it comes into conflict with the European Union, then fair enough. Every national government that supports that will either argue against the European Union or get thrown out, maybe. But at least the battle then will be being, we're being thrown out because we want to implement this program. We're not, we're not leaving in a fate of peak because we think you're all <laughs> capitalists, which frankly doesn't have much impact amongst the working class if you pose it that way. Uh, we, in the old days, we used to talk about transitional programs. Well, I, I don't think overthrowing the EU or destroying the EU as the first item in a transitional program <laughs> is really a good one. I prefer the other one, which is to take have a socialist program for changing society and we'll deal with the EU if and when they object to that, which of course they will. That was the same position in, for the Greek uh, government in 2015. They bottled it. But that's, that will be the position for any socialist government. That, that's the way to unite Europe. Not to say we're all against the EU. Comrade here has pointed out the Scots want to stay in the EU. The Catalonians want to stay in the EU. This is dividing the working class. It's confusing them. That's not the way to unite people. It's on the program for socialism. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, just if there's no one else who wants to respond. Uh, yeah. Um, <coughs> I mean, I think that's a really, really constructive uh, contribution that we should be organising on that basis of how do we fight against this, the policies uh, nationally which are affecting um, working class people, particularly on, on housing and healthcare and education. Um, and the, the programme that you talk about, uh, nationalisations, etc., a socialist programme is certainly to run up against the, the the EU. Um, it's also going to run up against many other international institutions and organisations that Britain is a part of, the treaties that it's part to, um, you know, and those would have to be dealt with ultimately. I think um, it kind of, and I think on the, the, but there is a question of, you, you know, you ask who is the EU, we also need to ask who is the working class in Britain, and I think um, when we're talking about who the working class is, there is a tendency in the British Labour movement to think of, um, yeah, to think of only the better off section of the working class as representative of its interests. Um, those that are organised in the largest trade unions, for example, um, or who uh, vote for the Labour Party or are activists for the Labour Party, or are in the, um, the broader sort of left periphery of Labour aligned left organisations. Um, I think the question of, I think when you said how Brexit has kind of exposed the reactionary nature of the British left. I think, that, um, I think that's really true. I think Brexit has exposed a lot about the reactionary nature of the British left. Um, for example, you know, it's uh, it's you had um, you know sections of the left arguing that you should vote for the Brexit party or that, you should, uh, that we should be you know that it's an opportunity to take control of immigration as well as go against all of these. Um, uh, regulations, which are supposed to be the main obstacles to socialism in Britain, um, and I think that is just being like we have to look at how the left has always been quite reactive in Britain. Um, if you look at uh, the way that the largest um, trade unions argued for immigration control several years ago, and that became um, part of Brit you know, part of the Labour's program under Corbyn to hire more border guards, 
for police. I think these are all things that we need to um, point to as also like you know Brexit as an opportunity to expose that nature and to ask where you know where is the British left when all of these struggles happen? What are they you know what are they actually doing when um, people are fighting for their housing and education and healthcare and also fighting for migrants' rights? I think in those struggles you find the, the kind of um, the yeah you find the Sort of direction, so can, I, can I throw a question to the yeah. meeting? Can we keep it? Uh, throw a can, question can, to the meeting. If, if there's uh, a please, vote please, next please, this year, please, Michael, please, please, remain Michael. or leave, which way are you going to vote? Please, Michael, we'll keep it. Uh, we'll keep the discussion as this. Please, comrades, we'll keep the discussion with uh, contributions. And if someone wants to speak, ask. I will give the speak. Right, speak, and they will speak. Um, yeah, hi. I'm confused on, you know, just yeah. living, uh, being against the British rule, but trying to live in the European Union is fine. But being part of the EU, because they have been oppressed for all these years and all that. So they're being reactionary to that. And going back to your comment about mm. the status and the status of the tax system. It's like, where do you, where do you take the needle and how do you like how do you start this whole fight mm -hmm. if you are confused about the problems that are happening right in front of you? So if we for example as an architectural system and correct me if I'm wrong, I there's no trade union mm -hmm. for architects. So if I don't have modes to solve some problems in my region, in my local region that makes so if I don't have this voice, my immediate voice against me having to sign a contract for 48 hours, you know, if I don't have this immediate voice, how will I do? How will I overrule or if I overthrow it? Mm -hmm. Can it you is. That directly, because this organization is looking to set up. Very oh, yeah. for That's good. <laughs> We're still summarizing the end. Eh? I mean, I don't want to interfere. Now is the end. Yeah. yeah? Okay. I mean, Common ground, yes, Mikey. That, that's good. It's a very uh, difficult and tiring uh, process in the whole left to the whole history. I mean, there is not still a convincing reason for me why we shouldn't speak about certain things which are actually uh, harming our lives. I mean, okay, let's let's. And these are certain mechan mechanisms of capital, actually. Yes, we shouldn't. I mean, if we don't, if we want to speak about capitalism, which is quite difficult in the everyday political life, to be honest. I mean, it's quite difficult to go to the, uh, you know, the world to say, oh, look, this is capitalism. I mean, you, you need to, uh, to bring it like in a way that there is a sequence, a, a, a rational sequence in the whole struggle. What you do, you should start, you know, your, your, your working rights, your uh, salary, and then, and then, then. I mean, you know, if there are certain mechanisms of capital, why we shouldn't speak about them? And let's not focus on the EU, NATO. Okay, NATO, we shouldn't speak about NATO. I mean, it's a problem here. The state, even the state, which is probably one of the one, most, the most major under capitalism, you know, uh, facilitator of all these policies that might be. We shouldn't speak about the state. We know that the state will be against us. And that's an interesting thing that, I mean, Michael says, uh, describes this uh, sequence of events that the national <laughs> government will go to apply this. There is another debate in the left who will actually apply these yeah. policies. Uh, for me, it's not very. You know, it's not very uh, easy to vision that 
a government will do it without, you know, the people's control, immediate control of all the staff, the means of production, etc. I mean, if he, if the is is possible for all these policies, why shouldn't we speak about it? You know, we see this wider struggle of what we want to do with against capitalism, against state, NATO, everything. Nobody will be, you know, uh, uh, de deorientized. How can I say it? You know, they will still have their direction against certain stuff. I think they will make their lives uh, easier, exposing certain things that actually affect their lives. Uh, uh, you asked what you should vote, etc. Okay, but you know, uh, Brexit has happened. We have to agree, we have to agree on this. You described that we need that we are still we are fighting in favor of migrants against all this stuff. So in this process, actually, what you are actually describing in a wider, much stronger vision, it's like we are, uh, you know, we want a better, a better society, a better, uh, better living standards within the process of Brexit. It's happening. Okay. And especially after that. So why couldn't we speak about this? If we do it, uh, I mean, I don't know, in, in Greece there is a different experience. In Greece you can see it as well uh, about the left. There is, there is lack of faith. There is lack of faith in the, in the left. I mean, that's a problem in the, whole, in the whole Europe, in my experience. We don't believe that we can do certain stuff in certain historical, very historical moments. And that's a great, weak, a great weakness. I think uh, for the whole left. I mean, and the very uh, apart from uh, the, I have two rules in my political thought, not the, the tactics and the, strat the strategy that I would always demand the socially necessary, not the capitalist possible. I mean, if I think that the EU or the fifteen hundred pounds pension minimum pension is the no socially necessary, I will demand it, whether it's uh, regardless of whether it is capitalist possible or not. So that's 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 an important thing uh, to add. Um, yes, the liberal left has been exposed in the in the UK. That's that's a certain thing, and I think that's not so bad in the end. You know, to to see things much more clear. Uh, and I think that uh, in always in the UK, um, I'm, I'm pissed off with this entries <laughs> infiltration to the Labour Party. For me, it's 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 a very uh, inefficient political stance. Uh, but I mean, uh, and if Eddie was here, he would probably defend it. We will never, we should never forget these extremely strong bonds between the Labour Party and the unions, because uh, the UK has this historical specificity that the Labour Party actually, that the unions created uh, this party. So it's very, very difficult, you know, to disattach these people from this party. Actually, but of course, the, the solution is not actually is not getting into uh, the party. And a very, a, a huge weakness about this, which has the social impact. I remember that delivery workers were having after the UCU, which is more uh, probably a more, you know, uh, uh, popular, let's say, more famous uh, struggle. The delivery workers have been struggling in the whole UK for the last whole year. I mean, which is uh, the first very, very important struggle against this new type of works, zero hours contract, etc. Uh, uh, this new type of uh, new type of employment, and unfortunately, most of the left were actually campaigning for Corbyn and Labour. <laughs> That's an important problem for the UK. And what is happening, and why the, the left and the Labour movement have a certain responsibility about this? Why eventually this UK government is so reactionary? Which is, I don't disagree. But the left and the Labour movement, the unions, have a certain, uh, you know, uh, responsibility about this. Uh, and we should que question about this. I mean, apart, nobody said that uh, the question about the EU is the only thing or, you know, the system. We should question why the, un the trade unions are in this uh, position, not only in, in, in the UK today, but in the whole Europe. Is it like the structure? Is it the leadership? Who is actually, who is the fault? Uh, is the ex exclusionary character um, against the migrants, uh, part-timers, etc.? There are several, uh, you know, factors that could probably affect it. Um, so, the EU is one of the major factors, I think, uh, for this situation, one of the major facilitators, and I think that we need to face it, and we need uh, to, have, to, to, to have it in our weapons, you know, when we speak about uh, what kind of vision we want, and 
yes, probably we can wait until uh, the EU disagrees with us. But, mm-hmm. you know, speaking about it beforehand is not a bad thing. I think it's a necessary weapon for a better, for an improved life, which certainly doesn't exist within the EU, as uh, <laughs> I think all of us, we all agree. Um, I mean, this thing about uh, uh, that the referendum was, uh, uh, how do you describe it, uh, a, a dilemma between the two imperialist uh, the UK. Yes, yes, yes. yes. I mean, uh, for sure it was, but I mean, we shouldn't see it in that perspective. We should see why there was not a left voice there. That's the big question. But it's all a question for the left. It's a question for the left. Why is it for the left? I mean, we have discussed in the whole uh, three hours now about the EU, which is a topical issue. So why don't why can't we see not only the the, the UK, you know, in the whole Europe? Why should we see that the, there is a huge lack of the of the left, which is also expressed among others in the fight and the speech about the narrative about uh, against the European Union? That's important. I mean, I I, I am I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about this. From a tradition, from you know, like uh, Giafi said, described that in Greece we have a, a left, let's say, tradition of uh, of anti-EU uh, narrative, which is probably uh, right because you know uh, the far right have been uh, very clear about their intentions uh, uh, for the EU. Uh, I mean, and for the referendum, nobody should uh, should just offer this seventeen point four million to uh, you know. Racist or uh, bad, uh, bad, bad, bad issues, you know, or bad mentality of people. This, that this was the that people left. For me, uh, Brexit, uh, Brexit uh, referendum, Brexit vote was, uh, you know, one a major historical probably one of the first that are coming uh, in this year that people said, "I'm fed up with this. I'm fed up with not only with the EU, not only with the EU, eh? not only with the EU, with the whole lives." So the referendum was a specific expression about this. They said, no, we don't want it anymore. And this is slowly happening in other countries with certain uh, far right. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, I mean, they say that you in, the, in France with Le Pen. That's, that's a bad, very bad thing about the French left. And we should think about this. That's, that's a major weakness because Le Pen doesn't speak only about the EU, which has you know, a not very clear stance. As I said, I think they want a, a rebalancing of the upper class in a better position within the EU of the French capital. But, you know, it speaks about other issues. And the left are lighting on this stuff in France, for example. So that's important. Um, yeah, I think uh, that this is more or less. Is there anyone who is willing to participate? If not, can I make a comment? Because it's, it's my second time. I <laughs> ask myself and I <laughs> agree. I agree with my mind. We forgot your question. Sorry. What is your question? What's the future of the EU? Uh, three oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. three strands. Uh, yeah. That's prediction. Uh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to say something about our, our experience about the uh, but then I think that very, very confused situation there, very, very difficult situation. But if I must uh, localize two things that I maintain from more experience, the one is the uh, lack of agency, the lack on the part of anyone from the government, from, 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 from us, from, from other. What's, what's uh, another party? And the other thing is that you, we were about, we, we were listening to very things personally. And I was listening to things that I, I could, I couldn't believe that I could listen in my life about what we would do, how we would do things together, how we would drive for another future. How we, and I don't want to, I don't want to be emotional. The thing is that the same people. Uh, was going to say these things to, to do these things was the same people that still stay confused about going out of the European Union. What you said before was that it was the conversation about a people who voted for no, we don't, we don't know this league, but that was saying the league in the EU. And apart from any 
any other aspect of our organization discussion. If you don't, uh, I can understand how exactly actually if we come to this point again or another story to process, if we, if we come to the point that the people should decide that we must do things other way, uh, radically another way. Uh, in Greece, I think that the, in that moment, the, the charm of the European Union and the impossibility of being outside of the European Union was paradoxically somehow at least equal to the impossibility of doing things other way. Yeah. And this is at least interesting of how to do these things well done. I would like to speak uh, in, uh, on behalf of uh, Andersia because I have been so active that I have been uh, so much involved in the debates that I just wanted to contribute with this without, being, without saying my opinion there. The question about the EU is eventually critical. That's what experience says. It's critical. It's definitive on what you're going to do in the future. It was 9, 2009, 2010, and uh, Andersia uh, used to be a party that was uh, in a very bad way, uh, focused on the issue without really considering other aspects of it. That's my view on the party. And I'm just trans transferring some experience there. And the rest of the Greek left used to be, um, or used to always say what Michael said, we will do our stuff and eventually they will throw us out or, you know, it will just come up at some point. And eventually uh, what came up was that the only, uh, political forces that had uh, some advantage when the bad stuff came were the ones that already had an opinion on it. And I have to justify that, I have to just say that we are aliens in society, so we are, we're not fully integrated. Uh, we don't know what's going on. We don't, uh, we cannot really get involved with local thing. When I say local, I mean British, uh, not in a local level. So whenever we want to speak about something, we say, what should we speak about that? It's so global. I will just attract people in a radical way. And we just come up with a you. It's easy. And it uh, usually makes a good ground for a, I mean, some uh, good debates. And I think that the, the difference is that without actually trying to um, force a debate with the local left, I think that uh, the local left here should already have a position in the EU. It's so critical. Should already have a position on what should we vote for in the referendum, mm -hmm. what are we doing now. Uh, all these things are like, for me, I would expect that they would be already solved and they aren't. And they, it's, it's a big issue. For, <coughs> it's a big issue of uh, understanding my terms, my personal terms that I'm going to uh, get along with uh, local left parties and also the I, my, it's, it causes a lot of confu confusion. Uh, I just want to say that uh, the party itself has a, some kind of experience. So the, what Nikos said about the criticality of the issue mm -hmm. is not just, I think, it's not just an opinion. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a print screen of what happened. And they, he just takes it and says, well, eventually it is. So <laughs> it's, it's, more of, it's more than experience, I think, from, my, from our viewpoint. I think that this debate has been so... Uh, or then has happened so much, so many times, and has been. I mean, it was. Uh, I I, ha I used to hate this debate. It was uh, <laughs> the most tiring, most boring debate ever. I was always doing it with what people that now are in the government. And eventually, what happened is that everyone that disagreed with this was in, actually. I'm sorry to say that, Michael, but everyone who had your position now supports the government or is close to this kind of thing. So it is critical to discuss about it now. And it's very easy to just say, I hate the European Union. It's very easy. You have to say that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I, all, I say to the workplace, the only thing that in my, my, my workplace I can say easily. And they say, oh, that's because you're Greek. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> uh, I, I thought I didn't make myself clear earlier uh, when I spoke about my European comrades. I didn't say, uh, I, I wasn't meant to say that the French people, the French activists uh, are not raising the issue and that's good. I'm saying that they are definitely against the European Union. 
there's no dispute there. They're definitely against it, but they don't think it's critical to have it in an everyday agenda when in Britain, just it's already there. So, yes. Yeah. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, go ahead. Um, the you, you characterize the um, at the um, the referendum as being what choice of European of uh, UK imperialism you want, you know, which party of it. But that's not the question that was asked. Yeah. You know, that's the kind of question they get when you say, you know, coming to Marshall State say, it was whether you want to be in the EU or not. Yes. And um, you know, we're talking about should we go with a kind of a, a pan-European overthrow of the European or should we confront people with an anti-austerity, pro-socialist kind of um, uh, kind of you know program. Um, this country is nowhere near either of those things. It's not even close to it. 17.4 million people voted against the EU. It's the most important event since Suez, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's split the two capitalist parties in half, and I'm not surprised because they're both on the bloody same side. Um, you don't, you know, Lenin, everyone, every revolution is always talking, you don't get to make revolutions, let alone proposing a program of anti-austerity or socialist measures in a vacuum of ideal circumstances. You do it at historical junctures. We're in one. And I think it's absolutely vital that we reclaim this vote and make it what it is. I don't believe that out of that 17.4 million people, even half of them, or two thirds or three quarters, were racist or whatever. I don't believe that. You're, you're the, the, uh, the, uh, the anecdote used of people saying, I'm against the EU on the radio, and people saying, why? Because I'm against the, uh, the, the policies or the whatever, and I don't know what they are. Of course they don't know what these policies are. But the people in Britain, the people from the Northeast, the people in the east part of London, the poor people, the working class of Britain, they know they've been shafted. They know they've been shafted. They don't quite know why or who's done it, but they know it. And this vote, I think, we've got to make that vote, express it of that, and claim it back, because it's the biggest thing that's happened to this country in a very, very, very long time. Um, and saying it's a split between two imperialisms, it may be in part, it may be in the Houses of Commons, maybe in the city or whatever like that, but I don't think it is here. And I think the failure, the abject failure of the left over the last three years, and call it the bloody left, over the last three years to reclaim this vote and actually turn it into an expression of those people who've been living under 10 years of austerity and the rest of them living under 40 years of neoliberalism is a bloody disgrace. And I think it's time we do take it and claim this historical moment back. Jens. <laughs> Are you on a call? He's on a call. <laughs> Are you going to speak? No, no, no. <laughs> Please speak in. Yeah. No, three, three, three very short comments. No, uh, first of all, for the, for the future. I mean, I hate predictions. I mean, it's not for the left. It shouldn't be. Uh, I think that you already see this kind, kind of, uh, con you know, continuing this kind of uh, nego nego negotiating the stuff. I mean, uh, the ECB will be German, the Commission will be French. These are uh, power balances there that uh, they actually express some of the things that you said. These three political uh, parts of the EU, let's say, like in uh, national level. Uh, but I think that a certain solution for them would be the deepening. I mean, the, uh, the friends who were among the inventors of, uh, of, the, uh, of the countries that established the European Union, they are actually pushing towards this. Not only Macron, uh, uh, who was the other guy? Uh, Holland, Holland was pushing towards this direction. Why, you know, the Germans <laughs> are still, you know, holding the horse just a minute. We will see they are still postponing that. Uh, second, Another thing, about, apart from this EU-Europe misunderstanding in the, in the UK, I think that the whole society has been uh, uh, bombed by this, the, the, the country is divided. The country is divided, which is, I mean, an awful story. I mean, and I don't know if the working class is divided, but I think that certainly uh, the, the, the referendum result was a class, class divide. 
uh, the medium, you know, the middle class actually people uh, were actually supporting the uh, remaining the EU. While the working class people who are actually suffering among others because of the EU, uh, mm-hmm. they have been actually probably most voting. You can see the results, the, the, the poor, the poor, the poor constituencies were actually voting against the European Union. That's important. And this is where the left should intervene, as uh, Simon said before. Uh, sorry? Yes, okay, yeah, that's it, yeah. I, f- I forgot the third comment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, of course, I think you can speak, but uh, I, I don't know, I have to probably you have to discuss about the closing. We close it, we can go to the pub after. Yeah, we We'll probably close it because the speaker's already made. Yeah. Well. It was that simple. It never is. Brexit, yeah. But it's not, it's not cheap. Class, not class, yeah. 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 It's not that. No. I don't think that everyone anyway. supports Brexit. Brexit. A black person in London about Brexit will be against Brexit. I think the white person in Berkeley is for Brexit. Yeah, yeah, it's still important. Yeah. Yes, important. So that's that's important. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, so meetings adjourned because the speakers, I think, participated enough in the discussion. Yeah. Mm. And we hope. We, I just hope that we there was a. Uh, good, uh, it's good discussion. I, I'm yeah, in any kind of way, doctor or not, at least. It was Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry to interrupt you in the middle of that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>